everyone. I'm Jen Hood. This is Amy Hood. We are going to be both your guest and your host for Adobe Live today. We're so excited to be here. We're monopolizing all your time. Um, and by the way, if you're over on YouTube, join us over on Behance because that's where I can, I can actually like see your chat and we can interact and have a good time. So do that. But welcome to Adobe Live. This is where we design live together, which sounds scary, but really it's only stressful for Amy, who is our <laughs> guest today. We have a bit terrifying. A bit terrifying, but we're Hoods for Design. We run a studio together here in Southern California. And today we're gonna to be doing some brand identity, which includes logo design, packaging. We're gonna be doing a fake beer company. So it's gonna be a good time. Um, but hey to the chat, let us know where you're from. Let us know if there's any friends in the house. We we love all of your moral support so that yes. we know we're not alone in this. We need the emotional support. Please um, give us thumbs up, friendly emojis, all the, all the love. Yeah. Let's take a look at the schedule though too, because there's a bunch of amazing stuff coming up after we're done. So we've got brand and identity design right now with us, Hudspa Design. And then after us at 2 p.m. Pacific time, you've got the XD Daily Creative Challenge with Andrea Epi. And then 2.30 p.m. Uh, Pacific time, you've got Draw Along with Kyle T. Webster of brush fame. He does incredible brushes that I've used a million times. At 3 p.m. Pacific time, we've got Creative Encore, uh, design off with Voodoo Val and Jetpacks and Roller Skates. So stay tuned for those things. But um, hey, in the chat. Hey, everybody. Johnny Niddles in the house. Stuart Mark Bodie. Hey, Scott Newsom. Hey, Zeb. Hey, Tracy Miller. Oh my gosh, so many friends. Thank you for being here. Voodoo Val, what's up? Stuart Dooley, our, our favorite South African. Yes. Oh my gosh. I'm so glad you're all here. Andrew Hawk Rattle. Uh, hey, who, famous who just, in the house. Who just killed it at the Creative Challenge, by yes. the way. Hey, Abid. Uh, so glad you're here. Hey, from Atlanta, Ricky. Uh, yes, we're not alone. We're here. And that's the great thing about Adobe Live. I, I love the community aspect. Yes. So again, if you're over on YouTube, join us on Behance because that's where we can actually chat and stuff. That's where the chat goes off. Goes <laughs> off. And PS chat, I need to know what you're watching on Netflix. I need to know what you're watching on Hulu. I need to know what you're watching on Amazon Prime because I'm running out of shows. But we just finished Ted Lasso on oh Apple gosh. Plus. It was so good. So good. Yes. So heartwarming. So funny. Yes. Yeah. But anyways, um, Amy, tell us all about Hutzpah who we are for those of um, the chat and uh, watchers who haven't met us before um, and what we're gonna be doing today. Yeah, okay, so yeah, we are Hoodspa Design. Uh, we are a type design and brand identity design studio based out of Southern California. We make fonts like this, Beverly Drive, Lone Pine. You might've seen our font, Palm Canyon Drive. I don't know, everywhere. It's awesome how it's kind of taken over. I really want to not be- not vain at all. <laughs> it's amazing, it's taken on a life of its own. Um, but we also do a ton of brand ID work. That's what we're doing today. And that is definitely one of our passions, logo design, um, building that out into a system and packaging and all these kinds of things. So we've worked with amazing companies, people like Disney, and then people that you may never have heard of, um, but I bet you've heard of the Lakers and that was a dream project. <laughs> that was the um, ultimate dream right there. Totally. But yeah, we get to do so many fun things and we always bring custom type into the mix and we're going to be doing a little bit of that today. So I'm pretty excited to, yeah, do our fake beer company for Green Room. So that's what we're working on. It's called Green Room. It's a brewery from SoCal, which we made up. It does not exist, but we're going to be doing a brand package for it today. So Aim, take us through the process that you would go with a client from start to finish on, on how we would do that kind of a logo package in real life. Well, we would definitely start by uh, setting the rules of engagement. You want to make sure that um, you're not just sending proofs to a client and saying, do you like this? <laughs> that is opening a can of worms that you do not want to open. You want to make that sure that there are parameters that you can measure your design decisions against so that you're helping their, your client make the best design decision. So usually we always start out with a discovery phase and we'll usually call um, or meet with uh, pre-COVID, meet with the client and we would just make sure like, hey, what are you about? What do you want to be about? What is this rebrand? for and what are our goals and then we take everything that they they tell us and we just listen we listen we make, take copious notes we uh what is what's the word you love that tech people love synthesize we synthesize it all together <laughs> exactly let the magic happen let it marinate and then we spit out this discovery deck that basically just recaps our goals and so whenever uh the client starts to get off the rails you can say let's go back to the discovery that we all agreed on let's make sure this meets the goals oh it doesn't meet the goals like let's let's make sure we're on track so I'll zoom out a little bit so you can see our audience over here, but our goal is to create a brand identity and packaging system for green room beer that is approachable, stands off the shelf and leaves room for growth for international sales. Cause this is a West coast brewery. Um, they want to of course like get a foothold in the West coast first and then grow into international markets. So our audience is drinking age people, probably 21 or 18, depending on where you're at to 35. So we want kind of like 
the tastemakers, the cool people who decide like, this is awesome. And then the 40 year olds will follow <laughs> the 40 and 50 year olds will say, Oh, what is this? Yeah, I'm still hip. I, I know but also up. the 40 and 50 year olds are just always going to drink Coors and that's okay. <laughs> that's where I am. Um, <laughs> of course, banquet beer. Uh, also I'll buy anything that Sam Elliott is a spokesperson for yes. Let's just be real. That mustache could sell me ice, ice, <laughs> a timeshare in, a yeah. time share <laughs> in, yeah. In, yeah. Um, so our audience, drinking age people, of course, um, West Coast drinkers first. So we want to make sure our branding feels like West Coasty, but we also want it to appeal to mass market. So um, we want to keep that in mind. And we want it to be appealing to tastemakers who like quality at a good price. I really want it to feel approachable like course, where it's like, you know, it's been around for a while, you know, it's trusted, you know, it tastes good, um, but you also, um, you know, that it's not going to like break the bank. Right. Um, think people who eat in and out or people who are vans. It's a great price point. That People kind of like Stephen Overturf, who says, <laughs> I am cool person. And he is right. <laughs> Stephen is a cool person. Okay. So our brand traits, I always like to say what the brand traits are for our company. We usually agree on this with the client. What we are is accessible, nostalgic with a twist and bold. But what we're not even more important is we're not expensive. We're not busy. I've noticed a lot of beer cans are very busy, very, there's a lot going on. So yeah. I want it to be like that Coca-Cola stark red can. I want to do something like that and I don't want it to be expected. So these are all of our rules for what this logo has to be. And by the way, these are all things that we've worked out with the client because we want them to approve this and get that first yes in our process so that they're already feeling excited and we don't start off with a very important design decision without them having bought into like our goals first. Right, you're getting a yes from them on something that's not design related so yeah. that there's like a trust and we feel like, oh yeah, we're, we're doing this together. We're all a part of, you know, um, the same, the same army. Yeah. So our core use is going to be on, you know, the can label, the six pack packaging. Um, and then of course, like delivery trucks, coasters that we're going to give to like breweries so that there's like that little, you know, branding moment, um, tasting room signage, all these fun little touch points, which we'll be working on tomorrow. And Jen will actually be designing those and I'll be hosting you. So yeah. be fun. I can just kick back and relax finally. And here's our competitive landscape. This is a really fun page that I like to present because when, whenever we present our final like logos, I'll usually just roughly mock it up on a can and then throw it in the mix of our competition. And it's amazing how you can immediately see like, oh, this stands out mm -hmm. and it sells it so much more than just pasting the logo on a page. So contextualizing your work is everything. Yeah. It is so, so huge in, in just getting something approved and getting client buy-in. So I've shown this competitive landscape and you can see almost all the cans are on that silver can base. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's like a, like a cost saving thing, but we can still like keep the colors limited for cost purposes, but stand out. So I want to do number one, brand color swash, big, full, almost like a Coca-Cola can, Coca-Cola yeah. red. That's what I want to do. Something like that. Kind of like what Coors is doing. I think they'd stand with something more vivid. Yes. Yeah. And I think another thing that we could do that's cool because everyone else is doing just regular horizontal text. Let's flip the text vertically so that it's super bold and it stands out, let's especially because our name is long green room beer. Yeah. So, and then I want our logo icon to be more prominent. I've noticed that not all of these beer labels focus on their icon very much. So maybe that's something we can try. That's a way to like stand out. Totally. Coors does it. Stone does it, but the other ones mostly focus on the word mark. Yeah. So let's try that. And here's kind of our mood board to give you an idea of what we want. It's funky. It's super funky, super fresh, um, fun, bold colors, but they, they're a little bit desaturated. I love mm -hmm. that. Um, I also just love this really bright yellow. I'm down to do that. But yeah. also, of course, has kind of the golden thing going. They so, don't own gold, though. <laughs> they own red more than they own gold, I think. Coors? Coors Banquet Beer. Oh, but then for the the, the Blue Mountains. Oh, so yeah. Blue and Taste red. of the Rockies. We can, yeah. we can own yellow. All right. Well, we'll see how it goes. But um, we might even try this orange down here on this Cheers thing. I don't know. But I love all this big, thick type. Um, it's really going to stand off on the can. It's really going to be legible. I like that. And I like these bold icons we have in the bottom left. Um, so something along these lines is kind of what we're going for. And of course, we want to make an ownable word mark. This is a page that we started including in our decks um, to get people ready for the idea that it's going to look a little odd. Like if you look at the Casper logo, there's something kind of off about that C, but that's why it's ownable. Like a great logo doesn't really feel comfortable at first. And that's on purpose. If it feels too comfortable, it's probably because you've seen it too many times before and it's too normal. You want something that's a little bit dissonant in the way that you can actually own it and it'll be recognizable. So we're going to, we like to prepare our clients to, to be looking for those things. So they're not like, Oh, it's kind of feels off. It's like, well, good. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's going to be memorable. 
Exactly. And some people are asking in the chat, Henry Anon and uh, Scott Newsom, uh, this is a fictional brand. We're making it up so that we have full creative control, exactly. which is going to be fun. We usually do real brands, but we were like, let's make up our own brand this time. Let's get full, full creative control. So this isn't a real brand, but um, they are uh, fictionally based in California. And so we are looking to do that West Coast vibes because let's face it, all of the world wants to be in California. We're this so, is what I think. No, yeah. <laughs> we're obviously living in our own bubble and we apologize. <laughs> but California is like, it's a beautiful place. Everybody wants to be here. So we're going to sell that California vacation lifestyle. Exactly. All right. So that's our, that's our kind of our goal outline and our discovery that we presented to the client. They've approved it. Our fictional client has said, yes, we're on board. So now let's hop into Adobe Illustrator. And, and we do, we work. always do our logos in Adobe Illustrator. And actually I also sometimes use um, like a type design software on the side called Glyphs app. But I love Adobe Illustrator for logo design because it keeps it vector, keeps it scalable and you have so much more control over everything. And so we do a lot of custom type work in Adobe Illustrator um, for our logos. Totally, I, I love Illustrator. Even when I make my fonts, I start in Illustrator because I'm comfortable with it. Then I bring it into Glyphs app. Yeah. So yeah, Illustrators is my boo, so <laughs> yeah. So to start, I always sketch first. So here's a look at my sketch that I did before you all got here. I worked on this a little bit and I just got out some ideas. And like I said, I wanted to do something that was bold, um, really thick lines. Maybe we can play with some thicks and thins. And I wanna do some fun swash action. I think that's how we're going to make this um, word mark ownable mm -hmm. and unique. So for some of this, we could probably typeset from some Adobe Typekit fonts and then customize. Um, and then for some of it, maybe we'll just create it from scratch. But and when I, she says Typekit, she means Adobe fonts, which was formerly known as Typekit. But if you go to fonts.adobe.com, there's so many incredible fonts that the license is included in your Creative Cloud subscription. And you can turn those on and activate those to use them. Um, and you'll just wanna double check that those fonts are, um, are allowed to be used for logos. I think most of them are, but it'll be in the licensing instructions um, on the tab in Adobe fonts. But you're right, we could probably um, use some fonts for like the base and then customize them, mm -hmm. or we could make them from scratch. Totally. But how would you, so you're gonna make this one from scratch, the lettering? Yeah, I think I'm gonna start by, I pulled in my sketch like I showed you all. And I usually will just pull that in and then put it on a layer, put it on its own layer, name it sketches, lock it. Then I don't have to worry about it. Uh, lock it and forget it. And then I make, after that, I make a new layer for guides. You can see that over here in the right-hand side. And I usually make those in, in a really annoying color like pink so that it really stands out when I'm using my black outline. So I'll kind of make my, I've got my baseline here. You can see I've got my um, cap height here and then I've got my X height here. So I kind of know where everything's going and I lock that and now I have this layer on the top of all that and that's where I'm gonna start building out my letter forms. So I'm just kind of working on this one down here that I really like and I'm just gonna start making points and I can kind of adjust it as I go but I'm, I'm gonna do it kind of quick and willy nilly because I can adjust it after the fact. I just wanna get my basic points down right now. And if there's anything that we've learned over the years from doing brand design, I think at first when you start with that blank page, you don't have to even think or worry about it being pretty. Don't think you're gonna make anything pretty the first day you start working on a logo or a visual identity, because it's not gonna be pretty. But you just have to get the rough idea out and then you can wake up the next day with fresh perspective and keep cleaning it, honing it. Um, Stuart Dooley, who's in the chat will know, like the first few days you hate everything you make for a logo project, but then after that, you're starting to refine things and narrow into something you like. So you can see she's working really rapid iteration. And if you've ever seen Aaron Draplin work, he does the same thing. He just just works quick. He makes another concept works quick. And that's because at first you just want to get all your ideas out on paper and not be too precious about it being perfect yet. And I'm just setting up some like rough guides every now and again so that I can know where I'm going and keep my um, angles consistent. Yeah. So that's what I'm doing right now. And I see you're working on different layers so mm -hmm. that you can lock the guides and then do your artwork on a different layer, which is super handy. And then luckily I have my snap to snap to something turned on. It's not <laughs> snap to pixel because I hate that one. Snap to point maybe? It's I, oh, it's just smart guides. And so it tells me like, oh, you're on the anchor. Your anchor's on the point, you're good. Yeah. So I, I really like that. And when I'm using type and people ask me like, how do you do lettering? It's so hard and it is so hard, don't get me wrong. But it's just shapes. It's just like when you're painting and people say, they look at it and they think that's a face, that's scary. Don't think of it as a face, think of it as shapes. Blur your eyes and just, you know, think of it as, as blobs. Components, yeah. And it makes it so much easier. So a lot of times I'll start with shapes and then go from there, start shearing and cropping stuff out. I have a circle, I've sheared it. Now I'm gonna get a rectangle to create my little counter cut here. And uh, I'm gonna copy this, Command C, Command F to paste in place. And just kind of 
adjust that in here. And I'm just starting to like build things out. I'm actually going to, and this is where Pathfinder becomes hugely helpful because it can help you um, minus subtract and add shapes together. Totally. So have that Pathfinder tool ready to roll. But it is, it's just shapes. And when you think about it like that, it becomes a little less daunting, I think. Yeah. Um, well, and the cool thing about doing your own type or at least customizing type for a client um, is that it becomes more ownable to them. It's You're not just typesetting a font that you know anybody could have. You're making something unique to it that allows it to be specific to that client's brand, which is very important for logos and identity work, that it is iconic to them uniquely in some way. And that's what we're going for here. And so if you are able to do custom type and to hone those skills, it makes it even more ownable because you've made it just for them, which is incredible. And another thing I like to do, like I've kind of set my widths here, so that makes it handy. I'm going to go ahead and just draw a rectangle that's going to be my stem for my R here. But I want to make sure that I'm consistent with my thicknesses of my stems. So I'm going to shear this and I'm going to match it to the angle that we've got here on this pink here. But then I'm going to kind of like bring it over here to my thick that I have on my E, which I like. And I'm just going to match it closely it'll actually be thinner than the round on my E because those rounded letters like E and O, those are always a little bit wider in, and a little bit taller. You'll see the E on the verticals, it extends past our guide a little. That's called overshoot because optically your eye needs that a little bit of extra on that rounded point to make it look like it's the same height as the R's or or not even the R's, more like uh, flat letters, lowercase letters. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's an optical illusion. So I think that's another thing, like when I was, early on getting into making custom typography and stuff, I was so worried about everything being perfectly even. And it's, that's so not it. And you, the more you learn, it's like, of course you want to start out with things being even and aligned and as similar as possible. Cause you want consistency. Yeah. You want to make sure it looks consistent and not like an accident. But after that, you start to realize like, okay, now what does it look, what looks visually right? Right. Like there's, there's perfectly right. And then there's what looks good visually. So I think a lot of um, learning about typography and lettering is learning when to break the rules, when when to adjust things for yeah. that visual correctness. And a know? great resource for that is House Industries, their manual for lettering. I think it's lettering manual or manual for lettering. Look it up. It is invaluable if you're getting started with lettering and want to know the basics of type design and lettering. So good. Totally. So Claudia Solis wants to know, oh, sorry, not Claudia Solis, which, hey, Claudia, sorry to, <laughs> to throw you under the bus there. Chloe Rubenstein wants to know, are you ladies using a tablet or just the last laptop trackpad right now. Right now I'm using the laptop trackpad, which is crazy. Like a but, maniac. <laughs> but I really have gotten used to it. Maybe it's because I used to go work at coffee shops all the time just to like get out and see people because we work from home. Yeah. And so I kind of, I would always forget my mouse in just every single time. So I think it's just a lot of it is part of just getting used to it. But. Yeah. And you can see, so you're like duplicating shapes to keep those consistent forms. Yeah. So I have this R already. So I just, you know, I'm option dragging the stem from the R cause that'll be my stem for my N. There's a lot of repetition in type. So there is a lot of consistency in a lot of ways. So if I just like cut this path, I'm going to get rid of that and just oh Ricky Haggerty got that book for Christmas yes it is insanely valuable I keep it on my desk right next to me because we've been working on a lot of font design lately um, to get some more passive income going and it's my constant reference for like quick little notes of okay because even little things like on an H you would think the crossbar and the two vertical stems would be the same weight if it's a sans serif and it's supposed to look like the same weight but actually horizontal um, crossbars are actually a little bit thinner than vertical ones because of the optical way we see things uh, but little things like that. Yeah. And another great resource. Joshua Young's, it's called Lettering Manual, I think. And it's by House Industries. If you look up Ken oh, yeah. Barber. Thanks, Natasha, for yeah, Ken Barber. Barber in the chat. It's by, yeah, Ken Barber. They're incredible. And if you also like that kind of thing, you should look up Ono Type Co on Instagram. And he has all of these amazing like lettering tips and tricks that he learned because he went and like paid for like the legit school in like Paris. So he's given us all the cheats, which is really cool. Yeah. So you can see how this is all kind of working out. So, and I like to, like, I've got my sketch here. I've, I've pulled it like right off to the side of my artboard. So once I get kind of far, I'll usually option drag and pull it off onto the white to kind of see where I'm at and see how it looks, you know, without all the noise. So I can see that that is too far over. So I'm just gonna kind of adjust that a little bit, maybe just direct select that anchor point and just kind of shuffle things around. But I'm really liking where this is going. Um, and someone asked there. about um, using a tablet for design. I actually just got an iPad and I was thinking about what I would use now that I've actually gotten used to the apps on the iPad. Um, I don't think I would ever do 
uh, this kind of like vector logo design on my iPad, at least not now. I prefer having my computer because the app is completely different for the, the tablet than it is on your laptop or your computer. And so on my laptop, on my computer, all my, my key commands and my shortcuts and all that, like I just have way more control and I'm able to work a lot faster on the laptop desktop app in Illustrator than on the iPad. And however, on the iPad, I love using, you know, the Adobe Fresco and stuff for illustration and that kind of thing and for digital painting. So that's kind of how I, I break those two up. So you can see how we're like adjusting things right as we go and um if i pull over this original one that we had you can see how much awkward negative space was in this underneath this r so i just kind of shortened that stem of that r out a bit that arm and i'm just kind of like adjusting as i go i think this top thing this top swash is also a bit thick mm -hmm. so i might just select these two direct points and just kind of adjust those a bit as well and it's kind of starting to look pretty freaking cool actually yeah. <laughs> i really like it so you'll see she's pulling these little handles on the anchor points those are uh handles that control what's called the bezier curve and if you can learn about bezier curves you can really get to know a lot more about what makes up uh, a shape and how those bezier curves match each other when they're at the top and the bottom of of the the letter and the form. If you kind of understand how those work, it can really help you with your lettering. Absolutely. Okay, so that's looking good. And then, okay, I've always loved that Pirelli, like long P. Oh, yes. I love it so much. Pirelli is actually such a long word. So it's it's almost like too long, but I'm like, <laughs> this R could be- But great. again, that like weird, but ownable, but odd, yeah. like it has to be kind of weird for it totally. to be that iconic. Totally. So I think what I'm gonna do is, and you know, your cap fix are always a little bit thicker. Um, so I think I'm gonna pull this down and then I'm just gonna use my, you know, I've got my cap height and my base height here. So I'm gonna use that to kind of start my R. And on my sketch, I did it a little too close. So I'm gonna adjust that as I go too. But I'm just gonna use my pen tool and I'm gonna go all the way out, create this. I could even probably have done this with like the rounded rectangle tool, but um, let's just kind of start. Ryan McQuaid says, I love those vector brushes in Adobe Fresco. Adobe Fresco has such incredible brushes and um, the watercolor ones that blend like real watercolor. I mean, it's incredible. It's a game changer if you're doing illustration, um, which because we do brand identity work, sometimes that does bleed into illustration if that's, that's right so for a client. So that's how I justified getting an iPad because it's hard when you have a laptop, a desktop, <laughs> and then you also want to buy one more piece of equipment that you have to keep updated. Uh, you got to justify that stuff for yourself. Am I going to make money off this? <laughs> okay, so that's looking good. And then again, we're just taking and copying things that we already have. So I already have my O's. So actually this needs to go up higher, I'm realizing. We need to make sure there's enough space. So I'm going to direct select these and just extend that up. Okay, that's good. And I'll just go ahead and do that. Okay, so now we've got our O's. I think what I'm going to do is sometimes what I'll do is like, I'll go to my Pathfinder tool if I've skewed this and I'll just go unite just to get my anchors back to the top, to the north four corners. Oh, interesting. Because on this one, you can see it's all, yeah, the Tiny little bits. anchor points yeah, are, like it's are all rotated. almost at 45s. So yeah. yeah. So it's really hard when you want to like scale in to do it in a way where you can then go like yeah and here i can stretch this now how interesting i didn't know that so yeah i'm so. learning things from my own <laughs> sister by the way we're hoods for design right now we're designing a logo and as part of an identity package for a fake co beer company that we made up called green room um hey gus martin how are you gus martin's in the chat oh, gus. Um, gus anyways, and Kathleen. also if you're over on the youtube side jump over to the behance side there should be a link somewhere because that's where we can see you in chat and say hey and become best friends and hopefully meet up in real life one time so what I'm gonna do yeah, is- Hector DelVal says, genius little tip. Yeah, I did not know that. Yeah. Amy, Amy's crazy. Oh, thank you, Jen. Okay, so I think- Oh, Claudia to... Solis would like to know about how you ended up at the sketches brainstorming. Um, like, how did you get to these concepts? What was your, your thinking? And in fact, you have to explain what green room is. Okay, so green room. Green room is a word. Um, it's kind of like a nickname for a wave. Um, if you're getting barreled, getting pitted, bro. Um, <laughs> And I just have always when loved you're that. Surfing. Like, so when you're surfing and, the, and the, the wave is curling over you, you are in the green room. It's also a word for obviously like people who go to shows or if mm -hmm. you're in a band or something, it's a word for the room that the band hangs out in before the show. So I think there's just all these really fun connotations 
um, and uses that feel very West Coast to me. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, I love that idea. Um, I think that would be a really cool name for a beer where it's like, if you get it, you get it. But yeah. it's also just like, it rolls off the tongue, green room. Yeah. Like, hey, grab me a green room. And like, it, found, it, it sounds works. relaxing in an odd way. <laughs> yeah, it, it works. Yeah. And actually I'm realizing my overshoots are a little too overshooty, but we can fix that later. So okay. we'll just yeah. keep going. But I guess what I'm going to do to make this M, Jen. I'm going to copy it from the end. What? 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 Yeah, no, you this is be... called This is called using what you've got and cheating. And it's <laughs> totally allowed. So hacking this... the system, hacking the mainframe. This is what we're doing Don't right make now. it harder for yourself. So on this, I'm just option dragging this, this um, stem that I had for the N. And guess what? I got me an N. Yeah. And it was that easy. So now I'm going to just... Can you hear us? Cool. All right, cool. Okay. All right. We're ready. And we are back. Okay, sorry about that. Yes, yeah, sorry, a little bit of technical difficulty. Would it be um, quarantine Adobe Live if there wasn't technical difficulties? Um, but yeah, um, someone asked, is overshoot a real term? And it, it is. is, it actually is. I don't know if overshooty is, which <laughs> somehow it's a bit overshooty. It's a bit overshooty, but um, yeah, no, that's probably not, but um, Hey, we're back. Um, someone's gonna. Park if anyone there. knows what the uh, actual name for that little stem on the G is, maybe it's just stem. Maybe yeah, that's it. it. Just be stem. <laughs> yeah. So um, what I'm gonna do to make the counter for my big long R is I'm going to just go. Um, I'm gonna go ca or I'm just gonna go object path offset offset path. I love using offset path if there's like a, if I want to make sure I get like an even. Um, yeah, size scale. Yeah, on all sides. Yeah, I, I really like because if that, you so. if you've ever done a, like made a circle and then made a copy and pasted that circle and scaled it down lower or bigger to make an exact like um, extension, if that makes sense, it doesn't do it exactly. You have to use yep. the path offset to get it exact on all sides. Yeah, and I'm not sure why that is that it when you scale it, it just doesn't work. But and then I like to you know kind of like adjust it myself from there. So I'm gonna like and it's this is like. This may not work, this idea, but I really want it to. And I'm yeah, gonna, I'm I gonna do too. force I, it as I'm hoping. We'll see if we can do it. But this definitely needs to be bigger. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna first start by doing that. Then I'll option click on these outsides and just kind of adjust from there. So we'll see if that works. We'll kind of pair it with um, some of the icons we have. I'm really excited about some of the icons that we have. Yeah. So, and we'll see kind of what works. But um, right now I think I'm gonna just leave this one alone. The best thing you can do to see if something is working is just leave it alone, let it marinate and come back to it. Um, that That's always like the best thing you can do. So and on this one, are you gonna work much more on it do you think? Or is it almost to the point where you're like, you know what, let me just start working on another concept. I think I'm gonna do that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just, I know for sure that this is still not big enough. So I'm just gonna fix this one last thing. And then I'm gonna start on some of the icons that we have. Um, Cause I definitely wanna make sure we have a logo icon that we can own. I think that's one thing that could make us very different than some of the other places. Cause it's like, if you think about cores, you can't, can you think, do you actually know what their icon is? It's not like McDonald's where it's like, you know, 
So I'd Coors, love it. it's the, the mountains. Taste, taste, uh, but right. that's on Coors Light. On Banquet, they don't oh, use it. Banquet, it's the little red bow tie. So it's like, do I have a problem? <laughs> do, do I know way too much about, about beer branding? About beer branding. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. So anyway, so it would be cool if we could, you know, make something that is really ours. So anyway, yeah. that's kind of where we're at on that. I'm going to let it marinate. I'm just going to kind of pull it up to the side over here. We've got it got it going and I like to keep all my you can see that I've got all my shapes that I've used to cut this out I've got them all still in there because I want to be able to adjust those later and kind of play with it um once I have like clear eyes clear yeah. eyes full heart can't lose exactly you know, as Tim Riggins says love that guy so we've got that <laughs> idea I like to present the client with two ideas. I like to give them a couple of options so that um, that they have a choice in the matter. Exactly. <laughs> I don't and like by the way, when we present options to a client, if we're presenting a, a, lo a logo and an identity proof, we're not going to include the one we like and then a really terrible one, hoping that they'll pick the one we like, because that's never how it works. They will pick the terrible one. So only give them two options that really do fit the brief and solve the problem. Because in our opinion, we've always been firm believers that there's way more ways than one to solve a design problem. And that's why there's incredible designers out there um, who could all, you know, there's enough work to go around because we all have different tools to solve the same, solve the same problem. Green room concept. You know, I am. So this concept right here that I'm working on, it's, it's going to be a monogram option, which I always love a monogram option because it's, um, it might be the most obvious thing, but um, if you do it well, it can be, it can be really powerful. And, um, you know, I, I just think it's a great idea. If you think about McDonald's, it's an M you know, but they've made it stylized enough to where um, it feels unique and it still can pair with the word mark. So I've got here, you, you may not be able to tell, but when sets are coming in, in when you're like looking at it, maybe from a hill atop a beach, they come in and they look like this. They've got these little wave arches. So mm -hmm. these are actually sets coming in to kind of play homage to the idea of like the surfing green room. <laughs> so I am definitely going to try to work that in in some way. And it will be stylized. I love it when it's stylized where it's like, it's almost like a delightful, um, it's a delightful like little hidden thing. Yeah. Like when you, Disney does a great job at this with their movie logos. Like mm -hmm. if you think about Finding Nemo, they've got that little hidden fish in the O yep. um, as the counter. There's so many great examples of it, but I love that little moment that delights the viewer. Yeah. So that's kind of what I'm going for. I don't want it to be like, hey, this is a wave. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, you don't. I don't want to have to like, it's the worst when TV shows do that to you, when they like make it, it's like, we get it. We we were with you, but thank you for spelling like it out. the script is way too obvious. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Like when they just spell it out for you, it's like, trust your audience. I think you do have to trust your audience a bit that they'll get it. Yeah. And a lot of times well, that's why it's also important to present logo proofs. I think at least round one, that critical first look proof, whether it's a logo or any kind of really creative work, we always present that first proof in person or over a video call where we're walking the client through it and we're controlling the pace of the presentation. And what we tell the client at the beginning is, hey, we're gonna present this proof to you. If you have any questions, you can chime in or wait till the end, um, but we'll just kind of tell you the story and walk you through it first. That way we can control the narrative and explain to them why it's a good decision. You kind of want to win them over, almost like you're in a, a court of law, like law and order, you know? Or like you gotta make men. a case for it. <laughs> or, or mad men, exactly. <laughs> And I'm, I'm like all about, I'm obsessed with consistency. Like our friend Josh Ariza and us, we send each other back proofs to each other. It's like, we're, you know, working on something and we want like a second eye. And I'm always like, does that match that? Is that the same? Like make the swatches match. I'm, I'm so obsessed with it, but I really do think it adds a nice consistency. So I'm just kind of making sure that my little wave sets that are coming in are consistent and that they look like they match and now they do. Okay, we've got a few questions in the chat. So um, Natasha Prakash asks, do you offer two versions for clients or do you include more? So we used to offer three concepts, um, but lately because we really have just really honed our skill, we only offer two um, and we offer two very like, they're amazing options and we prove why they work. And so um, that's what we present to clients. Um, and then um, Rivka O'Connell asked, do you ever get stubborn about a concept that you really want to make work, but it just isn't? How long would you try to fix it before admitting defeat? Okay, who asked that? Uh, Rivka. Rivka, do you just understand me? You see me <laughs> every time, every time I will spend, like just when we were planning this, I had spent, or no, I was working on it. My friend, uh, Dave Ali, we're doing some work for him and he has a surf brand called Almond in Costa Mesa. It's such a cool brand. It's like the perfect blend of nostalgia and minimalism and they make beautiful boards. So if you like surfing and you live in, well, they deliver boards worldwide. They so do. check it out, Almond Surf. But anyway, I worked for like four hours on this custom type that I was like, Jen, how good is this? And she was like, 
it's good, but like, why don't you try that other sketch you showed me? And so I worked on it for like literally 30 minutes and it was incredible. Yeah. And I kept trying to sell her on the one that I spent four hours on. And she's like, listen, <laughs> don't fight it. And it's so, it's just gonna, it's like a universal truth that whatever you spent most time on, you're going to think is the best, whether or not it is. And that's why it's so important to have friends, peers, mentors, people like the people in this chat group um, that you can send proofs to, to like check your instinct because our gut instincts aren't always right. We're very emotional creatures. And obviously we want our work to be noticed and we want gratitude to be shown for all of our hard work. So the stuff we worked longest on, um, we're going to be closer to. Absolutely. Um, but that's, yeah, you got to get feedback from others um, because it's so important. Then again, design is subjective. So you don't have to take everyone's opinion as, yeah. as written rule. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Okay, control the narrative. That's perfect. Ryan McQuaid says he sent proofs before where he knows they just jumped to the last page yep. and didn't read like Ugh. the context. And the context is so important to convincing a client that a design is right. So we just said that design is subjective and it hundred percent is if you don't add context that explains why the design is right based on the goals that you have. And that's why it's so important to align with the client on what the goal is for the project. That way, when you present the design and you walk them through it, you can say, now this suits our goals because it, for our purposes, it, you know, it would appeal to this audience. It would look great on a can. It scales well, whatever that is, you know? And what we do is we'll video chat with a client and screen share the proof so that we control the pace of the page turning. <sighs> Talk Take about, it over. Wow. Talk about a little control OCD. freak. <laughs> a little control-ish. Yeah. That's so funny. Um, but anyways, I just want you to see, I just want, I want some um, praise for, I turned the, the, the swoosh on the G, like the curve on the G mm -hmm. into the R, the wow. loop on the R. Yeah. Consistency, just baby. Just Consistency and cheats. I yeah. like to save time. I'm all about saving time. Fenotipo Studio says loves this concept you're working oh, on right I'm now. So excited! Thank you so much. Me too. I think this is probably going to beat the other one. As far as like the mark goes, so like you can see my little crossbar. You know how a G goes like this, and it's got that little crossbar here, and then the swoosh down. Yeah. So my crossbar is making a set. The top of the G is making a set, and then we've got this R, which is just going to be swoopy gold. So, yeah. um, so that's all alluding to our green room. Um, and then Ricky Haggerty wants to know which keyboard shortcut are you using to get the pen tool to go back to being a straight rather than a curve when you're drawing these forms? Oh, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. So like if you're in the middle, you can, oh man, this is like driving, trying to remember how you drive. So I think I go command C and you can just, if you go command C, it'll open up your little, what is this? Like a handle, yeah, handle your, your adjuster? Corner adjuster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And then if you click the handle just once, it removes it and becomes a straight instead of a curve. Just on that one side. Yep. So that's kind of what I do if I want to get rid of those or, yeah. So I'm just going to, I've copied that swash that I had on the G and I'm just going to transform, reflect it. And that's going to become my, okay. And that's awesome. going to become my swash on my R. Amanda Nazarino says, what advice do you have for a new grad who wants to get into the type design industry? Well, firstly, I'll say just like anything, it's all about practice. As Malcolm Gladwell says, you got to put in those 10,000 hours to be expert at anything. And so what I would do is pick a daily challenge for yourself or at least a weekly challenge where you maybe do lettering or, you know, a, a custom type solution on uh, even just a word or even just a letter, but something where you're constantly practicing your skill and you're doing it for yourself. Don't do it for a paid client yet. While you're trying to get that expertise up, just do it as the passion for yourself because that's the best way to create and play without those restrictions of being afraid of, will someone like it and will someone pay for it? Because those are the quickest ways to kill your creativity, which is why me and Amy still do personal passion projects to this day, because that's where we grow our skill and try new things that clients wouldn't be comfortable testing us out on. But then once we've proved we can do it as a passion project, clients who like that style will come to us and pay for it. And we don't have to be stressed about um, finding out this new skill on a deadline, if that makes sense. So just practice, 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 you know, and then um, get resources, watch and consume as much as you can about lettering and type design. Um, look on Glyph's app. They have a YouTube channel with a few people who use it, um, who have great tutorials. Um, watch Adobe Lives where people do custom lettering and things like yeah. that. Yeah, I think, and also like, if you're wondering how something works, I'll open up other fonts and I'll just see like, how are they, some letters are really hard to master. 
and I'll just say like, how are they mastering their N or how are they, how is the overshoot? How much overshoot is there on their O's compared to their, you know, flats, yeah. their, their circles, curves versus flats. You can learn so much by just looking at existing typefaces and like deconstructing them. Yeah. So, you know, so type any typeface out, then out, create outlines in a OW illustrator and you can see where they've placed all of their handles, all of their points and how they've created the forms of the letters. But by the way, Bob Ewing is in the house who is a oh, brilliant lettering James. and type designer. Follow Bob Ewing if you want to learn about type design <laughs> and lettering. True. And you just taught him. He didn't know that you could just click that handle and it would just really again. dude. Bob Ewing knows Bob everything. Ewing. So I feel I feel honored. Stephen Overturf says S's are a big problem. And I will say S's are the bane of my existence when it comes to Absolutely. type design. Um, but yeah, this is kind of awkward, but I, I kind of like it because I need I need a really obvious cut here because right now these are really heavy. This G crossbar, mm -hmm. even though it matches the the kind of where this R is meeting, there's a lot of heavy going on here. Mm -hmm. I need some thin and I'm trying to figure out how best to do it. But and I mean, it almost feels like, like the here. R, the leg swash needs to be less vertical. Like it needs to be more squished because right now the G is so squished. Yeah, squished. Okay. And the R is more right. tall, if that makes sense. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, I think I'm just gonna squish it first, which I know, oh no. I'm gonna squish Ooh, it first. We're squishing. And then I'm going to adjust. This is a, a crime, an offense in the design <laughs> community. But at the same time, I like to squish and then just fix it. Yeah, you know what I mean? What I like like sometimes you just gotta squish. I don't wanna have to mess with the handles while you guys are all watching and judging me. <laughs> oh, Rivka asks about the abstract series on Netflix, which profiles different creatives. and. I think it's Jonathan Jonathan Hoffler who's on that uh, episode about type design, and he actually is on Twitter. You've got to follow him because he does free type oh. design critiques, and they are the most insightful oh, yeah. things. You can learn so much about um, type design through just him taking apart something that you've made and thought was perfect, and then you realize <laughs> all the different things that are wrong about it. I need to submit um, mine again. I submitted it, but he was like kind of already done. He'd already done a few, mm. but I'm gonna just keep submitting until I annoy him enough to to respond. Okay, that's wow. a good idea. I, I like really where this love is this. Going. Yeah, <laughs> this is cool. This feels a bit heavy, so I am going to work on that a bit. But um, I think in general, I like where it's going. Yeah. And I think I'm just going to kind of. By the way, Josh Ryan in the house. Hey, Josh Ryan. Oh, what's up? How's it going? He makes amazing, hilarious books um, and illustrations from Texas. Yes, love it. He's going to be on Adobe Live soon, too. So I think that's looking good, but it does feel too heavy. So. Voodoo Val says, Jonathan, who? Jonathan Hoffler, who runs Hoffler, I think, Type Co. Um, H O E F L E R, I think. Hoffler. Yeah, it's incredible. A lot of undoing. That was the type critic. Yeah, Amanda Nazarino. Thanks, Josh Ryan, for the link. Okay, so I am going to just, again, visually, it looks too thick to me. So I am just going to kind of pull it in until I feel like it feels okay. But um, we may have to, again, just sit on it for a while. Exactly. And, and especially because we only have two hours, we're just going to yeah. get the rough shapes of things. Obviously, this would take hours and hours to really refine. Absolutely. And to be honest, sometimes we'll show stuff to clients that's maybe like 85% there. And then if they pick it, then we'll go through all right. of that like sweat that it takes to get you over the hump to like a really, really great, perfect um, logo, For which sure. can take time. So also, I, I have been loving um, the... Uh, cloud libraries we made yeah. one for our hoodsbow color palette and oh my gosh what a game changer yeah <laughs> it's like saved me so much time so there's that i'm just gonna like see what it looks like in blue because i might try it in blue i also loved that orange so i kind of want to just see how it works in some colors yeah and i and this love brings it. up a good point we'll test how things look in color and how things look in application before we present it to clients but on round one proofs for logos we usually never show them color because color is such a <laughs> divisive <Trigger>. it's <laughs> a trigger for people it's an emotional trigger and to be honest if someone sees color immediately they might make it a, a snap judgment about something not based on the form or based on the suitability but just because they don't like the color mm -hmm. so we always show logo presentations first in black and white and then we might show them potential colorways in round one after we've shown them in black and white but that way at least they've gotten their first initial reaction about it without color being a deciding <laughs> factor because you kind of want to take out as many questions yeah as possible so that they aren't focusing on sundry things that can don't really matter. That They're distracts. focusing on the core things of the shape, the form, the type, right? Sure. Yeah. Um, Javier Sola says, Amy, could I use your marinate word in my future combos with clients? <laughs> Absolutely. <Yes. laughs> May Absolutely. I stew on this? Can I stew on yes. it a bit? I am going to marinate on this a bit. Yeah. Okay. And someone else asked a great question. I can't find it, but they asked, 
as a new designer, would you recommend doing projects for fake companies, like brand identities for fake companies, or redesigning existing companies, um, even though it's not a real redesign? I'm so torn on this because I get, um, I get why it's fun to do fake companies. We're doing one right now. It's fun because you have all the power and um, so you can actually make something really beautiful. And I think there's a value to that, of course, but I do think it's valuable to actually have a client because when I look at portfolios, like just for when we're hiring or something like that, or when I'm looking to subcontract, if I see mostly fake work and not that much client work, it makes me wonder if they understand anything about what it takes to sell an idea, you know, or, um, you know, just client relations and working with somebody's feedback but still maintaining the integrity of the project where they feel like they've been heard, but you're still main, helping guide them to towards feedback that actually works instead of destroys the, the, you know, the project. Totally. So then how would someone who's young or maybe starting out get clients for that real experience if, right. if they don't have that work to show yet? I mean, I always recommend, um, first of all, it's going to be friends and family first, probably. And um, they, they say don't work with those people, but I mean, work with those people well, if you need to. And I think also you can, you can donate your services to people who, you know, need, need design help, but maybe don't have the budget. So, um, you know, find a cause you're really passionate about and, um, just reach out and just say, Hey, like I'm, I'm a new designer. I'm looking to build up my portfolio. I really love what you do. I really believe in what you do and I'd love to help you. Yeah. Just make sure that they know that because you're doing it pro bono, you get creative control at the end. You of course want them to feel involved. Yeah. So you'll say, listen, I want you to be involved, but, um, you know, because it's, because I'm giving you such a discount, like in the end, most of the creative control goes to me. Yeah. You know, so that helps you get a project you're really proud of. And it also helps somebody who can't afford design have, you know, great design, great design. Um, Josh Ryan also says briefbox.me is a good way to get practice briefs, which is a great oh, yeah. idea. And Lauren Holm also has a um, lettering generator. That's absolutely hilarious. So you should check that out. That gives you prompts to letter. Prompts to letter. Oh, that's and they're great. so random and so funny. Alice Lee had her on the other day and um, they were like, they both used the generator and it was so funny. Oh, that's amazing. But I would say for young students, if you were just trying to get practice, then yeah, redesign anything, make mm -hmm. up anything. It doesn't matter. But when it comes to being a live portfolio, what do you actually show people? Um, obviously, when you're a student or a recent grad, it's hard because most of it is student work. And usually that's really easy to spot. Um, so as soon as you can try and go out and get real clients, uh, even if it's just friends and family, all of our first clients as chutzpah, as a design studio, were friends and family. That's just how doing your own company <laughs> works at first. And that's okay. And a lot of them are going to fall through the cracks because a lot of your friends think they have great ideas and then they fall to pieces. Oh my gosh. How many <laughs> brands have we there. made for friends? So like, this is going to be awesome. And then it just never goes anywhere, but it was great practice. Exactly. It's great practice. It's, um, and why not practice on people who love you and will, will cut you some slack, <laughs> <Totally>. right? <laughs> uh, hopefully those friendships don't blow up over, over not graphic design. Oh, for graphic design. Please, not something so trivial as graphic design. <laughs> but um, so definitely reach out to friends and family and just let them know, hey, I'm doing design. I'll give you good rates. I just want to practice and uh, get some real portfolios up. Let me make you a flyer. Let me make you a website. Ryan McQuaid says, moving to Nashville soon. Love Nashville. Oh. We're from Bowling Green, Kentucky, an hour south of Nashville. So Nashville was our big city that we used to claim. We used to go to live shows there. We saw Thursday at the Exodus with like 100 people. And remember Thursday? Remember emo, everybody? <laughs> Jen almost got trampled underfoot. Good memories. <laughs> Good memories. But he says, a little insecure about applying for, uh, let's see, sorry. <laughs> Moving to Nashville soon, leaving my in-house design job of five years, a little insecure about applying to an agency and not sure where to look. Any tips for making the move from in-house to an agency? Oh, that's a good, Jen, why don't you take that one? Well, I'm not gonna lie. I've never worked in an agency. We've only worked in-house for small magazines. So I'm not the best person to ask, um, but I would just say, do it, do your best, um, go after the jobs um, because I mean, if there's anything I've learned, it's not just going to come to you by sitting back and um, having the connections. You've got to actually reach out to those people, um, re go out of your comfort zone and just reach out and, and hope for the best. So um, good luck. And I'm so sorry that we have no advice to give. Well, I think it's just, it is, it's a matter of just cold emailing. I mean, as far as like getting in those people's mm -hmm. eye gates, right? Like yeah. it's a matter of just putting yourself out there. And we're trying to do that more this year as well. It's true. Reaching out to dream clients. And it's kind of a similar thing. It's oh, yeah. very uncomfortable to be like, Hey, you don't know me and I'm in your inbox. And I'm sorry. Cause everyone hates that, but I think I could be an asset to you. So it's yeah. like that fine line of just being human, but also kind of selling yourself and letting them know why they need you. You yeah, know, totally. 
And so we do that with dream clients. We try and keep it short and sweet when we're reaching out. But another great thing you can do besides just cold emailing, uh, whether this is for a client or for a job, I like to look up people who work at the places that I want to be working with on Twitter, on Instagram, finding the art directors, the um, graphic designers who are the team there and just follow them and interact with them. Because if I can make a connection with them, at least I get insight into the world of that client or that company. And that's interesting to me anyway and i'm just like meeting people like that and then that also helps me create connections that might help me to keep in contact with that company um, if i ever do go for an interview or reach out to them asking to work with them right right jeremy wilkins says lived in bardstown lebanon and frankfurt for a while oh, wow. yeah kentucky <laughs> the thing i love about kentucky is we've stole all our city names from other places <laughs> there is a paris kentucky london kentucky frankfurt kentucky lebanon kentucky isn't that funny it's just uh, like these are i mean it was probably just from people moving to right. that area and missing their homes and so calling it those old Pretty, places yeah but um yeah rifka o'connell says how confident in your skills should you be before launching your own business Oh, to be honest, you're never going to feel confident enough. So I wouldn't wait for that, to be honest. But I would say it is invaluable before working for yourself to have at least three to five years of working for other people. And that could be in-house or at an agency. Um, but you're going to learn so much about process, about client interaction, um, all that kind of thing. And it's better to do it in a system that's already safe and set up on someone else's dime, mm -hmm. to be honest, than to be trying to figure that that out on your by yourself. Right. But at the same time, while you're working those three to five years for someone else, getting that experience, you can still be doing freelance on the side and building up your portfolio, building up your connections. Um, so I would highly recommend doing your freelance on the side even before you go full time. Question, Jen. Yes. This concept, it kind of looks like an S now, but I want it to look like a G. And right. I really want to make it work because I love the wave coming in. Mm -hmm. We've got that wave the barrel and then, you know, kind of like these other nice, like thick lines we've got going on. Yeah. How would you make it look like I know. a know. Okay. Well, it's green room. So this thing that you've got on the lower part is just to show the shore. Yeah, it's just the G, the little tail. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well then it needs to go up more. You think? Yeah. Okay. So maybe I'll At just least... cut these. I'm going to make a copy first. So I don't, okay. I got to have a copy and I'm going to cut all these and I'm just going to move them up and see how that goes. Go into my group, get all these, my shape. So Chloe Rubenstein says Fiverr and Upwork yeah. hurt the artist market because they make clients think artist work costs way less than it actually should. Um, that's very true. It really can. I find that Fiverr though is a completely different audience. Like people who are going to Fiverr for design are very, oh, there it is. they're not, they don't have that education, which is a hundred percent true, but I don't think that, you know, the education on what design costs. Yes, it's very different. I don't think they're going after the same clients that maybe we all are on this stream, to be honest. Um, so th there's a different level of client, obviously, that you can go after that does have a little bit of knowledge of what things would cost. Like if you can talk to a client and say, hey, my rate is X an hour, but that's less than you would pay for your, you know, your lawyer or, you know, your accountant, or maybe it's the same that you would pay for your accountant. People like that who understand the, the value of those kinds of professional services, um, those are, are great clients to have. And to be honest, like, some of our highest paying projects have not come from the big brand names that you would think that are listed on our site. They've come from medium sized companies that no one has ever heard of probably, <laughs> or very few people have heard of, but they have a good sense of business and they understand the value of, des of design. Yeah. So um, yeah. All right, so I'm kind of working on another again, but a that's wave. a great insight, Chloe Rubenstein. Yeah, it's fun to talk about these things. I love talking business. You know? <laughs> Okay, Eight. can you read the G on this one? Because I really love the idea of like oh, simple, clean, bold line, like the simplest icon, those icons that we had inspiration for. Yes. When you think about the, like the classic marks, like I love this, that it's a G, you can see it all, but you can see the wave. There's yeah. kind of like an angularness going on. I 100% can see the G, but can you in chat? Let yeah, us chat. Know. What do you think? Can you see the G enough? By the way, if you're over on YouTube, jump over to Behance because that's where we can see the chat and interact with you. Um, so I'm going to just option drag down this and I'm just going to try one where I actually have that going up that like G definer. And I wonder if that ruins the wave. See, and I don't think you need it. I okay. think it's more exciting when you leave room for interpretation. Also, maybe we option drag. Uh, Stephen Overturf there. says he can read this as a G more than the other one. I have oh, to okay. agree. As cool as that okay. one was, I don't think it's going to work no, like we thought. Yeah. Which is also an interesting point. Explain, AIM, why we don't show sketches to clients. <laughs> 
it is, you know, for me anyway, every time when you sketch something, it could seem to work. And then you take it into Illustrator and you could work on it for five hours and you can't get it to work yeah. in the right way. Once you have like, you're thinking about like everything being even and equal and that kind of stuff. Yeah. But then the client's already married to that sketch and they don't understand why it's not working. Right. You know? So it is weird. You'd think that if it works in a sketch, it should work in, you know, like shapes and in design, but it, it's so weird how sometimes it just doesn't translate. Yeah. All right, so okay, I'm everyone is voting that. yes. It looks like a G. And okay, and how do we think going. about like the cut? Like, does it follow the the swoop of the wave, the the G, like the lip of the wave, or do we like it cut? Everything's clean cut. Right. Oh, hey, Jennifer Pohl. Jennifer Pohl in the house. She owns a really cool company called Curio Studio. I think that's what it's called, if I remember correctly. Curio House. Curio House. They make the cutest, coolest little like. Um, wheel gift cards. It's so hard to explain, but please look it up. It's amazing. <laughs> but Jennifer Poole says she likes the bottom one the best. Okay. And uh, Bobby Ewing also votes for this mark. And so does Amanda. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And what do we think? Do we like like the curve? Is that too like action sports? I almost think it looks a little too sleek, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Like um, I think Javier Solo is right. It's almost starting to look like a badge for a vehicle. <laughs> oh, interesting. Okay. Which I Rivian, buy this where car. you at? <laughs> yeah, Rivian PS. We seems like a West Coast. <laughs> seems like a West Coast brand that would like that would do well. Okay. Yeah. I'm loving this. Okay. But do we like how it follows the lip or do we like where it stops? Top or bottom? The top one has a little more retro feel to it. Okay. It's a little more like stamp. Okay. Like you can see it, but it's not. Okay. So I'm just going to pull these over to the side. I like to oh keep- Oh my gosh, Matthew Flick in the house as well. Hey, Matthew oh. Flick. Teacher of the year award for Matthew Flick. I mean, he's just so cool. He teaches at Modern School of Design yes, in they Ohio. Yeah. They, they recently rebranded, but um, yeah, man, you want to talk about a really awesome school. And I it used to be a two-year program. They offer, I think, a four-year now too, but I love that they're offering a two-year program yeah. that's actually reasonable for people because not everyone can afford a four-year and not everyone feels comfortable taking out the loans, you know? So yeah. I, I just think it's so cool that they're doing that. You okay, all. We picked the right one. We picked the top one. That was the right one. Chat's a little bit delayed for us. So it's like, we kind of just move ahead, but we're all in the same, you know, distanced by, by space, but not by emotion and creative genius. Yes, yes. <laughs> I will say, I really like where we're going. And I think we've fleshed out enough ideas to kind of start like honing in on which two we like best. For me, it's definitely these two top, right, bottom left. Mm -hmm. Um, I also really like this one too, but I want to start pairing it with fonts. Cause I want to see like, are we going to do something? Are we still going to stick with like a custom yeah. word mark option? I'm or... just going to say it, Amy, you're not going to like me for it, but let's just remove the bottom right one. No, <laughs> I'm okay. so sorry. All right, I trust you guys, but I'm going to save it and use it again later for something else. Okay. If anybody has a company that starts with a G and it's got waves involved, or it wants to be a SoCal brand, hit me up. Hit me up. We'll, we'll sell it to you. Oh, we'll sell, we'll sell it to him. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, that's funny. But I never delete anything. Do you? My artboards after I'm done are like mayhem. In fact, I get so paranoid. I just have to save a new round one what? file. And round on that one, one, I will delete everything. But I, oh, I like funny. to keep everything as it was. I'm going to start separating out my two artboards that I'm going to then import to InDesign mm -hmm. for my proof so that I have it, my two ideas kind of like on their own. And I want to make sure I have an icon standalone that can be like the avatar on social media and things like that. Totally. And then I want to make sure that I have my word mark that can maybe stand alone. And then I want to have something where hopefully they can work together. Cool. So let's pull this down. We're going to auction drag and we're going to start just testing some fonts. So we're going to type out green room and I always like to type it out and I want to do a couple different variations. So I'm going to pull it over here where I can actually like just option drag to kingdom come and have um, different options. So I want to do, I also want to do one in all caps. So we're going to go um, type and we're gonna go change case, uppercase, because we wanna see how it works in both those scenarios. And then we're just gonna go option drag, and then we're gonna go command D. Command D repeats that. Command D repeats it at the exact same distance. Yes. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start typing some of the fonts that I know I Amy, have. Amy, save your file. Holy smokes. <gasps> <laughs> Anna Tomzak, thank you so much. <laughs> I'm just glad they have the auto save now, right? Like, don't oh, we have maybe, the recovery? But why tempt fate? You know what I mean? <laughs> but thank you, Adobe, for doing that because, woof. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go in and I'm going to look at some of the fonts that I already have turned on. We can always um, search on Adobe fonts for some other things. I'm definitely going to use my own font, Beal, because I love that one. It's super funky. I don't know if it'll fit for this, but we can try it. Yeah. Um, let's see. What other fonts could we maybe what do? What are in chat? Tell us some of your favorite type foundries where you like to look. Adobe fonts oh, is yeah. incredible, obviously for, uh, you know, it's included in your subscription that you can use all those fonts. Um, the license is included to use it for logos and things like that. Um, but what are some of your type found 
foundries that you like to go to, maybe that are more independent. Um, I'm gonna try, let's see what else. Amy's already doing some self promo here with uh, <laughs> Beal, Beal font. That's the second one from the top. That's our typeface. Um, someone asked earlier, what other things are you adding to your um, service offering for clients? Well, type design is actually one that because we were doing so many logos and we had been doing so much custom type, we realized, gosh, this could start being a focus beyond just logos. We could actually be building out these typefaces for clients. So that's something that we've started to focus yeah. on more recently. And I think it is kind of a more niche industry, totally. which gives us kind of this added level of perceived expertise. <laughs> I say perceived, it's just a critical <laughs> term because we're not the best at it. I'm going to be real with you, but we do know how, and we've gotten enough expertise to be really good at it. And um, we're, you know, we're just always learning more and trying to be better. All right. So I'm on the Adobe font site and I'm just kind of looking at some things. I want it, like I said, I want it to be chunky. So I'm going to turn this one on from Eric Olson. It's called Maple, which I really like. Um, it's got like some nice, like um, personality yeah. points, you know, I don't want it to do, be just a boring sans serif. Totally. So, and I'm still going to probably customize it. So I'm turning that one on that'll automatically sync. Um, and I might look for just one more. Someone mentioned Ono Type Co, which is a great, uh, typeface foundry. And, and they're actually on Adobe fonts, which they is are. incredible. They have most of their fonts on Adobe fonts. Yeah. If not all. Great. Yeah. And then future fonts is something that was created by the Ono Type Co. Are you sure? Designer, I think, uh, yeah, I forget his name. John Edmondson. Edmondson, there yeah. we go. Yeah, he created it. And it's where people release fonts that aren't completely done yet. And so you get them at a cheaper price, but they're so experimental and cool. Okay, so I'm torn on, let's just start working here with what the one we just turned on. It was called Maple. Oh, Fenotipo Studio mentions Velveteen Foundry. They are an incredible foundry out of France and they give free fonts away and they're so yeah. creative and experimental and weird and great in the most amazing sense. Definitely recommend that. So I'm definitely feeling the title case. Um, yeah, I think. So I'm going to start with that. And um, I think for at least this one, maybe we do the sans, or maybe it's for this one. That kind of looks like it fits, doesn't it actually? This one? I don't know. You don't think really? So. <laughs> <laughs> we do this all the time, by the way. Really? This is what that. It's, it's hard to show people your work. What I think and my brutal honesty is probably oh, yeah. cutting her to the core. It's harsh. So if you yeah, do ask for I'm feedback, gonna... which is really great to do regularly and often before you show a client, then do it when you're ready to receive the feedback. <laughs> I wonder if I think it might be a little too funky for, but maybe not. But if you do the best to... work, so I can't. I can't say. Well, let's. Let's just keep trying here. Let's let's yeah. say this is it. Okay. Let's say that we're, the, the wording is going up the can, right? So I'm going to, this would be here and then maybe, so I, we would want to have a stacked version and a horizontal version. So let's kind of option drag out. Let's say this would be smaller. And yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe you're right on that one. On this one, we can get funky though, because it's really simple, you know? So, and also what if we add like a little circle? I know that I tried to do it on the other one, but like, I kind of want to add a little sun circle. Is that too much? I just feel like oh, it could be really so, fun. No, I really like that actually. What if it went to the right of the top of the G and yeah. was in line with, yeah. That side? I think that's more contained. If it stayed on the top, when you put it in avatar situations, it probably would force the icon lower than into the surface. Does that need to go there then? Oh, I think we're losing something. There's some, there was some flow that was, yeah, I think it needs to be centered. It needs to be like up here or something. Yeah, it could work. Well, let's hear what we'll do is we'll create a little circle. Hey, Doc Reed. Good to see you. Preview saying hi in, in the there. chat. Oh, someone else said hi. Uh, Patrick Weber and Chris Porter. Yo. Oh, what's up? Memphis is finest over there. Memphis is finest. Definitely look up um, Creative Punch, an incredible uh, marketing firm that, that does brand identity. A lot of uh, soccer slash football, F-U-T-B-O-L football. Um, <laughs> Ted Lasso football. Ted Lasso football. Um, check them out because they do a lot of really great branding. You know what? Does this work? Too much? <laughs> Maybe too much, yeah. Okay, but what if, okay, let's- But at the same time, at Hoodspo, we are known for extra branding where we probably go way too far in everything and that's what we love. We, we're very maximalist. So Hear me out, it's hard for us to say, to reel things back. Oh, for sure. <laughs> Does that needs to go over there a bit? No, I think that's fine. Rifko O'Connell says, how do you remember so many people? Pure love, love and affection. <laughs> I got love for these people. No, but to be honest, it was from the days when we still went to conferences in person and just, I met so many amazing people. And to this day, I would recommend still doing, you know, live chats and uh, even online virtual conferences because you can still make the best friends. So many of my closest friends that I still talk to, I met on Twitter or Instagram. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
so this somehow got there's like a double oh that's why to go i'm just gonna direct select those two points and go command j to join those they weren't joined and it was creating like a visually weird point so i think i am going to take this custom type that i made because i actually do really like it and i'm just gonna instead of having that crazy r i think i'm just gonna try to make it a little bit more of, approachable to the masses <laughs> And because I, I think we can save this and I do like what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Like I like the character, but I like how bold it is. So but you can see she's starting to adjust the R because the volume of the R, like the heaviness of it, oh, we're trying to match it to the rest of it. It got a little bit thick. And when you have letters like that, where you have a lot of points connecting at the same area, like the R um, leg and, the, you know, the circle. I, um, I'm losing the counter. All my here. They're just <laughs> flying out of my head. Well, anyways, they're all meeting at that one point. So it's making it look a lot heavier than it actually is. So you'll, we'll like overcompensate for that um, optically. Favorite conferences. Uh, love Creative South so much. Cop Conference is amazing, which, which J. Mark Bowden just mentioned. Creative um, Works in Creative Memphis Works is in Memphis one. is incredible. Yeah. I mean, Adobe Max is always stellar, oh, but that's incredible. like going to the Grammys or something. It's like, you know, like that is the pinnacle oh, as far of course as like amazing. production value, just like, you know. And they have like, it's like you get to hear a talk from Dave Grohl and Stanley Tucci's going to yeah, teach you Billie how to make Eilish. a cocktail. Exactly. Like that's incredible. just like a whole nother thing. But as far as um, I do like going to smaller conferences when it comes to really making um, like meeting people, um, I, I feel like like both offer a great, you know, value. So totally. I, I love Adobe Live or Adobe Max so much, um, but also love those small conferences as well. Uh, Fenotipo Studio said brand new conference. And yes, it's incredible. Oh, it's incredible. If and you first round is a really cool one that they do where they have people present first round proofs and how it actually went and walk you through like how the, how the proof processes were, had worked on that project. So I really like that one. That one's really cool. Yeah. And if you really do I have a lot of interest in logos, brand design, definitely, or even just a, a new logo. And uh, Armin Vitt, who runs the blog, is just so, he's got a really great humor to him and he's just got like this biting sarcasm. It's really great. I love the way he reviews things. And while the comments can sometimes be a <laughs> bit harsh, I have learned so much about brand design and icon and logo design from the commenters. Totally. Amanda Nazareno says, do you have any design podcasts that you like? Oh, oh gosh, it's so hard. I, I try not to listen to de design podcasts. <laughs> Only because like, I don't want to be one dimensional, you right. know, but I may have like cut out like a really great way of like learning things. So if anyone knows any, I think I just don't know of any, I, I have, I saw that John Contino is starting back his again, which I'm really excited about because he just cracks me up. So I'm excited to listen to that one. Um, but yeah, let us know. Oh, and the Weekend Creative uh, crew, they have their own podcast now called Per Our Last Email. Which is hilarious. And it sounds so funny. I listened to Dohee Yang's because I love Dohee and that's, I think, how I kind of figured out about it. I didn't know it was them. And so, um, yeah, it's pretty funny. It's like ho horror stories that we can all relate to. Totally. So uh, that's a really funny one. Hannah Craig, the uh, brand identity, the rebrand blog, I mentioned it's called Under Considerations Brand New. And I'm so sorry to the moderator. We're listing so many links right now and they're probably like struggling to get them all in there i'll try and add some as well so um, I think this is a little too tall but yeah oh yeah the Ooh. chat is going off with some great podcasts cool sarah and d said are there any blogs that you follow for weekly inspiration that brand new under consideration oh, i love that's incredible so that's like I, we just mentioned one. it yeah. yeah but uh besides that i just started following a lot of type designers now that i'm getting a little bit more into that like uh mark simonson i think he has a and then hoffler co i don't think this is um, working i keep trying to make i keep trying to force it but i don't think it's happening really and we're doing but it's looking the r is really matching the g a lot more than it was yeah and i think uh, it's okay to get tomorrow when we look at it again that's you know? the key that is the key. So I think I am going to just maybe, yeah, like lighten this up a bit. These feel a bit heavy still. It's nice. That is a great, great inspiration source. Fenotipo Studio. So true. So true. Voodoo Val, you are killing it with the links. Thank you so much. We are oh, like, is Val we're hitting our... you with so many and you're, you're Did we get Val as our, as our moderator? How lucky are we? Val, what's up? How did I, I'm so busy in it that I'm not like getting to see, but Val is awesome and she has her own show. She's going to be on later today. Yeah. So tune in for that. Definitely stay tuned for that. P.S. If you're just tuning in, we've still got about, I think, 40-ish minutes. And we're doing a logo and brand identity for a fake beer company that we made up. 
who knows? Maybe this is our retirement company. It's called I Green Room. <laughs> Actually, my retirement goal, I want to be a private eye. I want yes. to be paid to like Jessica Fletcher. <laughs> yes. You want to be paid to be nosy. <laughs> to be nosy. But I love oh. solving a crime. I love solving a riddle. I love solving a puzzle. I love puzzles. Like I, I think it would be so fun to be like a digital sleuth. Yeah. Like I, I, I was following along with the like Golden State Killer, um, like with, um, oh, what's Patton Oswalt's? um wife she's now michelle yeah, she McNamara. Passed, but michelle mcnamara she was an author and an online sleuth and like they actually helped catch a catch her book on the <laughs> it's looking great i'm so sorry we're gonna get back to design <laughs> it's looking no, no. so good yeah, some really. people mentioned that you could maybe um nest room under the g the green like pull the g down and mess nest room to the right or someone mentioned okay. that you could space but so they I were love that idea yeah. of making the art because it, it's like it there was too much negative space there so and if we have this then it creates this like nice little um encapsulating shape you know so we're yeah. just i'm gonna i'm gonna option drag that so i can get Ooh. something that matches and then yes. i'm just gonna flip it and sometimes what i do if i want to make sure that the distance is equal and i don't want to have to like measure i'll just grab this a rectangle draw a rectangle from that shape to my in, and then I will just option drag that down and I will use that to make sure that my distances are the same. I'll yeah. make sure that's lined up and we just need to move that down the teensiest bit. Nice. So I use shapes a lot as cheats. Oh, the totally. shape builder tool. Oh, and the shape builder tool has changed my life. I oh, yeah. Someone was asking about that earlier. Explain the shape builder tool. Yeah. I mean, it's just a great way to really quickly. It's it's a quicker method than like the Pathfinder, essentially. So it's like they do the same things. You know, it depends on what you're more comfortable with. And I've always just used Pathfinder. So I that's still kind of my default. But um, I recently learned the shape builder and it's like absolutely And it's incredible. almost like um, live paint tool where you just click on a selected shape and it will break right. any overlapping elements and you can into see. different fills and outline. It, anyways, yeah. we actually learned about it live on the last Adobe Live and we were like, the chat was trying to walk us through. Oh, I like how that kicks up actually. Yeah. So I was you could flatten it's it. It's going to, well, what if it all, what if, oh, <laughs> it all connects and wow. it has a shape. What if this corner on the top right was square, but the other ones are rounded? Does that make sense? Oh, I hate that. <laughs> you know, when a brand tries to customize a font, they're like, well, here's what we'll do. We'll round a couple edges willy nilly for I no really reason. don't want to mention one that I specifically am thinking oh, about. You know Let's I try can't... not to talk trash about anyone no, on no, this podcast. No, no, of course not. Of course not. Like there's so many people that have to weigh in on those corporate brand oh. solutions and I know how hard it is. So, and never. if you're feeling bad about a logo and where it's ended up because of uh, client feedback, don't. We all know it's, it, it's it never going to everybody. It's never going to be exactly what you wanted. That's part of design. That's the problem solving part. It's like marriage. <laughs> you have. I don't. Here's, which we've never been there. <laughs> yes. I speak with no experience. <laughs> But it, okay, let's say it's like a relationship because it really is like any relationship, even with sisters or business partners, yes. you have to give a little and that's just the way that it is. You never get everything you want. And if you do, you're probably a brat. Am I right? <laughs> so it's like never, there is always going to be compromise, but know when to like make your stand, know when to know what hill you're going to die on, I guess is what I'm saying. And that's just a phrase for like, know what battles you want to pick as far as like, you want to save your... Um, you don't want to make a fuss about everything, right? Because you then save your fights for stuff that you really matters. Yeah. Like me and Amy, before we send a, uh, send a proof or present it, we'll be like, what are we going to, what hill are we willing to die on? And what stuff are we willing to give, to give on? in on? Yeah. And we'll say, look, um, and so we go into the conversation knowing what we want to make a stand for and knowing what we'll let the client have, you know? Um, okay. I have an idea. It's so funny because the chat has so many good ideas, but it's like when someone's trying to art direct you with words and you're oh, like, I don't sorry. understand, but I know what you're saying would be awesome. So um, Terry Johnson says, yes, connect it to create the room. The green connect? room? Well, the some people are saying that the swash could have almost connected to the M, I think, is what I was hearing. Oh, like a down? Okay, we can yeah, try that. Maybe. So like, we're just gonna option drag. We can totally do that. So what we can do- What's interesting is I always think of a wave crashing from left to right, but what you've just made is a wave that's crashing from right to left. Right. Yeah. So we can do it like that. Oh yeah. Oh, that's cool. That actually has more. Um, yeah. It's not so much like, yeah, it's not so obvious. It's actually like way more exciting. And it feels more symmetric. Uh, like the spacing feels more yeah. right. When it went all the way up on the right hand side, I think it was too heavy on that totally, right hand side. It, totally it threw it off. And actually centering a logo like that would be a total pain in the butt Oh my gosh. because it, it's actually not really centered in itself. And especially if we, mm, but 
on the M. Yeah, it doesn't mm. work like you would think. If anything, the M would have to continue to the right and yes, then cut down. That's it. That's totally it. Okay, so yeah. I'm just gonna. I'm using my white arrow selection, my white direct select tool, which is like my best friend in the whole world. Sorry, Jen. And um, I use that a lot to adjust things that I've already created um, instead of having to make something new from scratch. Okay, so there's that. I'm just gonna just close that in. Okay, and then Nikita has an idea okay. to round the R ascender where it hits the, the horizontal line to round that connector there so that it mirrors more of the G. Here? Uh, down on the lower part, those two corners totally, making it totally. rounded. Totally. Okay, so great just, idea, Nikita. That's great. So we can actually try to use the shape builder if I can find it. I don't use it that much on here. So I, oh, here it is, shape builder. So the shape builder, if I just draw a line in between these two, it connects them. <gasps> yeah, it's really cool. So, but those weren't, <laughs> those weren't aligned. So let's go ahead and align those first. <laughs> oh, it's because one of them has an outline. And oh, the outlines doesn't. don't match. So yeah. I'm just going to go like that. And I'm going to, so I've got those two selected. I'm going to go to my shape builder and you just draw a little line. There it is. Holy smokes. And then I'm going to direct Stone the crows. So now I'm going to direct select these two corners and you see this little dot pops up and I'm just going to use that to start rounding. And that's a really Oh yeah, your to corner tools. Yeah, love those. And it's interesting if you make so your now I don't need this. I'm just going to delete that. I don't need that now. I like it ending like that. I do. I didn't like it connected. See, that doesn't connect. Why doesn't it all just <laughs> <laughs> This is when we break up. <laughs> this is the beginning of the Although end. now the top and the bottom don't really match. I'm just gonna move this because this is definitely not it. So let's get rid of that, but we'll save it just in case. Just in case. So I'm also gonna copy that and get rid of it because that might be it, but I don't think so. So I'm gonna copy that over there. And now I'm going to, now we have the room to play with this. Oh my gosh, you know what this could do? It could cur curl up and actually just create a wave. Too much. Okay, wait, move the R back over and see if you can just align that to the end. I don't know, it might not back, work. Back over where? Like there? Oh, with the O's and the yeah, M's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but with the word. Okay. I don't think, what do you yeah, mean? I don't know. Yeah, no, I'm, I mean, I'm I, here's what I'm thinking. So I think we just go, let's match this. I've drawn a little guide. I'm gonna just hold shift and. Okay, Brian Patterson says, asks, would you say that style guides are mandatory for every client that you design a logo or mark for, or is it up to you to decide who to make one for? So I, usually if we're only designing a logo for, for someone, Usually what we'll do is like a one sheet PDF for them. That's very simple. It's like, hey, this is this is your space guidelines of space to keep around the logo. Here's some examples of what not to do with your logo. <laughs> and we'll show them stretching or rearranging elements. Uh, and then we'll just tell them at least, ah, gosh, if it's just a logo, there's really so little you need to tell Color, them. Color, spacing. So really, yeah, it only comes into play if you're doing some sort of a brand package where you're going to include type and color and things like that. That's when we would right. start doing uh, brand guidelines for people, which by the way, there was a point in our Hutzpah life as a studio where we could only get one-off logo projects. And we realized, oh, well, that's all we're showing on our portfolio. So we started giving people insane deals to do packages so that we could show on our portfolio full systems that had more than just a logo that had type color and some sort of collateral. And after that, it's weird. People have to see it to know that you do it, to know that they want it. And mm -hmm. um, so we, we had to show it um, to be able to get it. And since then we just don't take on any work that's just a logo. Uh, and what we do is with our proposals, if someone just wants a logo, we'll show them a package with just a logo. And then for a ridiculously easy price jump, that would be silly not to choose the slightly larger price for the way bigger scope. Um, we bump it up. <laughs> I'm gonna try cursive. I don't, I don't think that's the right thing. I think I want, what I want is calligraphy. Yeah, because I was thinking it might be fun to do something like, see like this Casey. I like that, yeah. And it does you know, harken back to what you got going right, on. Which I like, so. Ryan McQuaid wants to give you a pat on the back game <gasps> for surviving the stress of having us, um, okay. how many people? At least 400, 400 people, people as your art, art director. <laughs> 400 <laughs> shoulder art directors, my nightmare. Oh. Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> Okay, so I am gonna turn on. Oh, Casey's already turned on. Great. It's like I knew that I needed it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna I'm gonna use Casey, which I'll type it in here in my character panel. Casey Classic. By the way, if you're just tuning in and you're on YouTube, jump over to Behance because that's where the chat is, where I can see you and say hi, and Amy can see you and say hi. This is Amy. I'm Jen. We're with Hoodspa, and we're designing a logo and an identity um, for a fake beer company we made up called Green Room. Okay, so like, let's say, okay, first of all, which of these do we like? Do we like it with the sun? I like it with the sun, I think, but also... Earlier people said they like the sun because it, someone said it add kind of like a human element to okay. it. Um, but that's I how like it could, it could look go in either the way. Yeah, yeah. 
What you'd have to do is, I think, send them an avatar version where you overcompensate. We'll see there. If well, can there. you move it up a little? I can. I can absolutely. That negative yeah. space at the top. I don't. I mean, that doesn't bother me. <laughs> I <don't. laughs> no, I mean, it doesn't bother me. <laughs> but do, I don't like that it looks like a person. Actually, I don't like that it looks like a like a bathroom sign. <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Does it look better there? I, I mean, that's too. I actually like that. I kind of like yeah, it. Yeah. It adds the. And it kind of follows that like diagonal that we're using yeah. to add that, you know. But it, actually, it feels like it needs to be in the middle of whatever this is, centered on the center. So that's where it is. Yeah. Okay. So let's go ahead and say that's our icon for this one. So um, at this point, we're kind of moving things off that haven't worked, and we're going to start separating things out onto our boards for what will eventually go into our proof deck. And when we make our um, design files, I like to set mine, you've got yours at the default eight and a half by 11. But what I like to do is set mine up for a 16 by nine um, landscape so that when I drop it into our um, presentation deck, it's like the exact right aspect ratio. And we build our um, proof decks in InDesign because that's where we have, you know, our templates already saved. Um, which by the way, get your proof deck, like get your discovery deck, all that, create a template and then just save as, and have those things easy to replicate um, per project. That way you don't have to be starting from scratch every time, right? Totally, I agree with that. Daniel yeah. Ramos says, I wish someday to get to this level. I believe in you, Daniel. <laughs> if you could see our early work, in fact, if you go on Dribble, you go <laughs> all the way back in our profile, we realized the other day that we have never archived anything. So you can see all the way back to the first designs because we got on Dribble even before we started Hutzpah, like a few Ooh. weeks before. So it would be fun to go back there and see that it wasn't always so like this. <laughs> So what I'm doing is I'm just kind of making all the different variations. I want to show them that this logo works in a myriad of layouts, right? Right. Stacked um, on its icon on its own, mm -hmm. um, horizontally oriented yeah. for like a website. And you could even do one even more horizontally oriented with like green room on one line. You right. Know? Maybe we have that descriptor. And for my descriptors, I always like if I'm using like a really personality font like that, I might use something like nondescript JNL, which is one of my favorite fonts from Jeff Levine. It's like it almost looks like a hand painted signage kind of a thing. Right. So it's like, it's a little bit imperfect and wonky and weird in the best way. Right. So, and I'm gonna just kern it a bit cause those O's feel a little bit wide to me. I'll just do a couple things here and there. Sarah D who asks, do you have your proof deck available in your project proposal template? Actually, if you save as on our project proposal template, that's what we did. And we made our proof deck just from that. Um, so it's all the same type styles, all the same layout. We just changed the title from uh, proposal to discovery to round one, round other, two. Yeah, we had a few other things. Yeah, I mean, the sections are obviously different, but um, all the type styles and like, you know, the main uh, structure of it as far as like the pagination and stuff kind of stays the same. So. And sometimes what I do, like for something like this, where there's really thick, thicks and really thin thins, like if you think about scaling that down, um, like way down to like a favicon, which is, this will probably be the favicon, right? Favicon, favicon. Anyway, it's going to be that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to scale it way down. And then I might use either um, offset path or just add a stroke because I want to make sure that those thins don't get so thin that they get lost. Right. So, and that's, that's something we would give them where it's like, oh, in your tiniest iterations, you can use this variation, which is a little bit thicker so that the detail doesn't get lost. Totally. So I'm gonna and just... that's a handy page to have in your brand guidelines is just like what files to use when, how to use these files, like as simple as it is. Mm -hmm. Some clients won't know when to use a, a PNG versus an e EPS and things like that. So um, yeah. I think I'll just go. Hey, Sarah A from the UK. Thanks for joining us. She asked, how much do our logo packages cost? I'm going to tell you right now. It changes for every client. So we have generally three tiers that we've priced that we're like, okay, for a small, medium, and a large size business for logo type and color, because those are the three things that we can always depend that we will deliver, logo type and color for a brand identity package. Uh, and then after that, we'll usually customize some sort of collateral for the client based on what their business is and what they need. Um, so we kind of have in our, in our mind though, a small, medium, large pricing. And then after we talk to the client and kind of hear about their, their value metrics and, and um, you know, the size really of what, who they are and what they do, then we kind of like fit it to them to make it just right for them. You know what I just realized? I never measured this. And now I'm seeing that this negative space is different than this negative space. Those kind oh, of things yeah. make me crazy. Yeah. I want it all to be super consistent, totally. super 
super like it works. So like, I'm gonna make a little rectangle there. <laughs> little rectangle here. Picket 10 editor says, stop lying. You only respond to the famous people. Not even true. I'm telling you, we <laughs> still do projects for friends that you got pay called out. not that much. No matter how far you get, you always still do stuff for friends inevitably, or just for like smaller companies that, that you, you believe, really in. believe in. And to be honest, the, the bigger projects, make it to where we can still justify doing a few of those small projects. Totally. If we were only doing all stuff for, for smaller companies, obviously it would be hard to maintain um, the income goals that we have. But because if we get a certain amount of larger clients and we can also do maybe stuff, to be honest, the smaller clients give you more freedom and flexibility than often the larger clients right. do. When so you're working true. with big brands, you're a lot of times working within existing constraints, there's a lot more risk. And so you have to be a lot more careful. Um, whereas with small clients, you get that blank check, man, you get yeah. to do a lot more. So we still do love working with small clients. Although can I play devil's advocate? Sometimes when you work with small clients, because they're working with their own money, they can be very precious with decisions instead of trusting you because there's a lot of fear attached with, this is my savings, yep. you know? So it, there is a lot more work that sometimes has to be done initially just to create that trust that like, hey, I'm for you. I know what I'm doing. That's why you hired me. Yeah. But once you gain their trust, those people are like, they're like your best friends. Like totally. my client, Jeff Wang, who runs a yoga studio that we've been doing work with for forever. Yeah. He sent me Z Zabar's, Zabar's bagels the other day from New York as like a Christmas gift. It was so kind because I kept complaining about California bagels. Yeah. Ba bagels here are like pieces of bread with holes cut out. They have no idea how to make bagels correctly in California. It's a travesty. All right, cool. So we've got that option kind of built out. You can see, and usually what I'll do, like I'm gonna go ahead and save this and I'm gonna open InDesign for the last like 15 minutes or so. Good idea. That yeah. we have because I like to lay out my proofs and show them, okay, here's like your key mark. Like here's the one you'll probably use most freak, most often. Um, but here's all these other marks and what they're for and why a logo comes with a system of, mm -hmm. of marks, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to open up a round one proof for a different client and just save as, that's what I like to do. Okay, so we're gonna skip that. So no. Oh, Stuart Dooley has a great question and good job on your, your type formatting. So I saw it. it, he does asterisk, 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 please see this in all caps. <laughs> I saw it. He said, trying to stand out, um, what percent of time do you invest in your own brand versus um, marketing? Wait, in your own brand versus marketing. I'm thinking that you mean in your own company versus client work. Am I right there? In your own... Okay, no, yes, you are saying that. Okay, so for us, it's changed over the years. When we first started Hutzpah, our own design studio, the first two years, uh, I have to be real with you, because we started when we were a little bit unprepared and very young. <laughs> we were just scrambling to get work and pay the bills and not um, you know, run out of money. So it was very much mostly service-based um, spending our time. Um, but by year three, we realized, okay, we need to reinvest in our business, actually take the time. We were running behind on doing bookkeeping, on getting our website updated and things like that that are very important for courting new clients. So slowly, slowly, we've been building up more and more time to spend on internals. I would say between years three and like six or seven, it was more like uh, 60 to 70% client work and then 30 to 40% just internal management and tasks that you don't get paid for but they're important for you know keeping eyes on your, your business and just keeping it running smoothly. And now that we've built up our audience and our offering products and um, passive income kind of things like that, like um, you know our fonts or our book or things like our course, we're probably actually spending more like 50-50 um, as far as 50% of our time on internal projects or internal you know marketing initiatives and stuff like that and then 50% of the time with clients. And it has totally shown in our revenue breakdown. So now about 50% of our income is from products that we've launched. Um, and that includes typefaces, our course, our book. And it's so awesome to know that that product, we created it once and it's gonna keep generating income even without us having to continue to manage it with actual ongoing time, effort and energy, or at least not that much, That's right? That's what I love about our fonts too, is like, not only is it like so rewarding to have a typeface that you've built out that people yeah. can use, it's also so cool to see how other people use it. And then even beyond that, it's like, it just keeps making money and the more people use it and share it, um, the more it kind of gains momentum. So it's like, it just keeps kind of snowballing. I, I love font, that fonts has become such a thing for us and yeah, it's, totally. It's a really cool one. And actually learning to market things, which Stuart was talking about, has been kind of a new thing for us too. Um, as far as not just marketing to our organic audience, which is our newsletter, which by the way, if you have, if you do freelance or if you have your own studio, 
get a newsletter ASAP, get at least something where you can capture people's emails. They can subscribe to things because, you know, social media, you're renting that space that people, someone could hack into your social account. You could lose those profiles and you would lose your audience. So you want to capture those, that audience um, and get them to subscribe if they can, so that you can talk with them directly and you, you don't ever lose those people. Um, so that's like obviously an organic way for us to sell things and market to people who have already followed us. But lately we've been learning the ad game, which is so scary. Um, and I don't want to be an annoying person bombarding others with ads, but we're, we're trying to figure it out. So I'm just in InDesign right now and you can kind of see um, what I'm doing here. I'm, I've am i got all of my little marks on the page. I've kind of laid them out in order. I've got up here, I always like to name my options easily for the client so that when they give me feedback, we're all on the same page. It's not totally. like the one with the little dot and the, the swooshy thing. It's like, you wanna make sure everyone's clear and on the same page. So yeah. I've got round one, option A. And I make sure to include the round two because you know, there'll be a round two potentially if they have edits on you know a favorite option. Totally. So uh, below my um, round one, option A, then I might do something like notes. I might include notes, things that I want to review with the client and I want to remember. So I'll just put notes and then I'll do a bulleted list or, you And that's know. a great cheat sheet. If you're reviewing this with a client over a video call or in person, instead of having to remember what you want to say on the spot when you get stressed, having that little notes area is great for the client later on when they re-review it or if they pass it along to anyone who wasn't in that immediate meeting. But it's also good for you because you remember what you want to say about it. Totally. Oh By the way, Adobe team, I love you all. Can you bring in, you know, in InDesign, when you can align a bullet point, the text in it so that it all aligns on that same margin. Can you add that functionality to Illustrator, please? <laughs> Jen, this is for type setting. <laughs> no, I know, but I just want an Illustrator every once in a while, please. <laughs> okay, so we're going to just kind of format this a bit. I've got notes and then I'm going to, you know, type some things in here that I want to draw the client's attention to. Yeah. Um, you know, scaled, I might mention that the scaled down favicon um, has been adjusted to be legible. Yeah. And I might even have to further adjust it, you can see. Like, yeah. So, but for now we're just gonna keep working. And I love this little tip of like, if you're making a bulleted list and you wanna make sure all the text lines up, exactly. you're just gonna go command and then the bar and it'll make sure everything lines up with wherever your cursor's at. So I'm and right And that's the that. feature at Adobe that I please, please, please want an Illustrator. Because <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I just make notes in there and I just cannot stand the ragged justification on the bullets. And I'm just gonna kind of adjust my artboards here. And then if I save here, of course, because it's linked in, in um, InDesign, it's oh, going Ricky to Haggerty. Update. I'm so sorry. Ricky Haggerty said our ad targeting hounded her so long as she bought the book. <laughs> it's working. No, you heard I'm, it here. I'm sorry, Ricky, but also I'm glad we found each other. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Okay, cool. So I'm just going to kind of like adjust this, but I've got everything marked so that they know, like when I'm talking about something, a lot of clients don't understand the verbiage that goes into logo, word mark, logo mark. Honestly, half the time I'm like icon, logo mark, you know. So it's like, I'm trying to make sure that, the, that we're on the same page by labeling everything super clearly. I've got option A, I've got here. And what I'm going to do is even before this page, so I'm just going to go to my pages bar and I'm going to option drag one right up here. And I'm going to pick the option that is the key option. So I'm just going to delete and, these notes. And why is that? I want to show them, like, I want to have a wow page where it's like, look at just this. Because, you know? yeah, when we're going through these proofs with them over a video chat or in person, the first we say, okay, this is option A. We want to show them one stark mark that is, like, the clearest encapsulation of that concept on the first page. Because if we show them that second page with all those different variations, they'd probably get overwhelmed. Absolutely. And inevitably, they say, which one is my logo? They don't understand yet. So we have to show them, hey, this is your main logo. And then on the second page, we'll show them, all right, these are variable logos that are used for different versions, depending on where they're being used. Right. Yeah. And that's when you explain it to them. And that helps them kind of process it in a logical fashion. You're, you're telling them a story and you want to kind of like drip content it to make, make sense. Totally. And then, so like, once I have all my pages that I need, um, I'll just, uh, basically just, you know, option drag or, you know, select them and make copies. So I'm just going to select that, that first option, go down to the page three. I've got them all shift selected and I'm going to duplicate those. Okay, quickly, um, Sarah A says, unrelated, but has anyone ever told you you look a bit like Leslie Mann? Amy gets told oh. all the time she looks like famous people. I have never been told I look like a famous person. Is it you person. or me that looks like Leslie you Mann? You look like Leslie Mann. Oh, it's so weird because now that I'm getting older, I'm getting different things and I'm like, I'm never sure if I'm like offended or excited, you know, but yeah. Leslie Mann, I'm, I'm, that's nice. Okay, Fenotipo Studio says, curious if Disney made you sign NDA or non-compete contracts. I can't remember about the non-compete, but they so. did have terms 
you know, that we just had to keep it quiet while the movie was under wraps, obviously. And that makes sense that a client wouldn't want you to be leaking like progress shots or anything, you know what I mean? So there was like, you know, simple things like that, which are were pretty um, standard with most clients where you just keep things quiet until projects are launched. Cool. So I'm just going to keep going and like putting in some, and you know what I always do in a proof too, which we may not have time for, but I, I might go ahead and just, um, I'm going to save this and I'm going to open Photoshop because I like to even mock up the logos just really roughly on a can. I want to show them and I, I might even put in like a, a page where I show them the logo mocked up roughly on the can just so they can see how much, how great it looks and how much it stands out. It's so true. Mockups will do so much for your proof decks. When you show someone just a logo on a white background, black on white, it doesn't look real yet to them, especially people who aren't creative, they're non-designers. Um, they don't have the imagination we have and we can't expect them to. So we have to show them what it might look like on real use cases that you know would really help win them over. And um, obviously if you're, you know, you want your rates to reflect the time that's going to go into doing this. Right. So make sure you are building that into your time, you, you know, because it, it does take extra work. Oh yeah, for but sure. You've mentioned before, which I love doing that extra work of seeing how it might look on a can, which might require a little bit of extra design beyond just the logo, obviously. Mm -hmm. It's a great way to also so true. It's, it's so, so true. So that's why I do like to test it. And let's grab a, let's grab a um, little mock-up that I was using the other day that I really like. It's just really quick. So I can just kind of throw something in here. Um, so let's go ahead and double click this. We're gonna turn off this layer. And um, so go to my here and I'm, I think I'm gonna select, I think I'm gonna select this one because we're going, and it's gonna go up the can. So we'll see, I'm gonna Maybe import them gonna, separately. Yeah, good idea. Yeah, so first I'm going to, I wanna do this orange swash. So I'm gonna go into Photoshop and I'm just gonna create a box to create a color. And I'm gonna double click that. Oh my gosh, I love it. We're all, we're getting all of our doppelgangers now. Everybody's joining in. Thank oh, you for it. telling me mine. Everyone said someone who was it. Dog Reed said, Jen, you look like famous people's twins. <laughs> <laughs> That's hysterical. Uh, Elevation a lot asked if we used um, proof pro like apps that help us get approvals from clients through the app. We oh, used to use Basecamp, but to be honest, I realized that the less I have to to educate a client on how to use yet another app, the better, because a lot of clients just won't learn new programs. So um, I try and keep it as simple as possible. I just send them a proof PDF that they could easily forward to people on their team. And then I just get an email approval. And then this is an important step, save the email as a PDF where they approved it. You always want proof of that approval, you know? Um, and it doesn't have to be approved, but it could say good to go. It could say anything oh, that shows nice. that they've given you the green light. Just notice that the blacks don't match. Oh, that's, I've done that before. Yep. All right, so I'm just gonna make that, paste that back in. Smart object, and I'm just going to rotate it and hold shift down to get the perfect rotation. Now I can release shift and I'm just gonna have this go down. We're gonna see if this works. It may not work, but I just wanna see. And I may have to rotate them both, but I've imp imported them separately so that they're e each easily editable. I mean, you can it see already how it's good. already looking really cool, right? So it's it's not fully there, but it's definitely getting there. I think the icon can get smaller. Really? I, or the monogram. Bigger. Again, terms are really hard to remember, but it's important to get used to using them properly. Okay, so that gets smaller, and then maybe we do... Green room burger. There, okay. And then the cool thing is, and he this as a... Um, as a JPEG or a PNG and put it in our proof deck. And we're already showing like our client, hey, look how good this looks already. And it's, this is with minimal, you know, yeah. minimal effort. And right now it kind of looks like a sun-kissed can. I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna lie, I'm seeing sun -kissed. <laughs> But um, the other day I designed something, I'm like, this is so good. And then I accidentally designed that sprite. Uh, you love it so much. Right. Oh my gosh. So I think I'm just gonna go ahead and save this. Oh, hey, Chris Porter. With the new color. And yes, Elevation Allah also mentioned Adobe Dimension, which also lets you yeah. almost make your own mockups. Like it's almost like doing mockups in Photoshop, um, but they've got like a suite of different products that you can bring JPEGs of your designs into and place them onto things. So I'm just gonna save a quick JPEG. I would probably add a little bit more, like maybe descriptors like beer and things like that. And maybe I will just do that really quickly. But um, but I think this gives a good idea of, you know, maybe it could even be something like um, white ale. Maybe we do this more specific, oh, yeah. whatever this is gonna be. So I'm just gonna double click here and get a black, okay. Even Oops. having it in white might be good. Seeing it in that white. Totally. So then Smaller. I'm just gonna, <laughs> Jen, 
I'm going to apply. It's and I'm popping gonna too much. Okay, cool. So that's kind of there. And let's see. Yeah, maybe, maybe you're right. I have, a, I'm, I, have a, I have trouble with, that's like the hardest part for me is getting everything aligned and sized right. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and hit return on that. I'm going to select these two together. Stuart says, might need to be green. This is what's so funny about color. It cracks me up. To me, I'm like, this is a greenish teal. That kind of counts yeah, in the green. Right. Color, but Stuart's like, <laughs> turquoise. Nah, this is turquoise. I know. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. We, yeah. Which Stuart, uh, we can rib each other. Okay. So I'm just going to save a quick um, quick JPEG and I'm going to place it in my proof. And actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm actually going to make the background white because I want to put it in our lineup of oh, right. cans. And I want to I want to show that it stands analysis. out. Yeah. yeah so um, I'm going to go ahead and just do this as a PNG. And we're... We probably have about 10 more minutes left. So we'll, yeah. we'll kind of run through this last part and then we'll keep working on our own and we'll be back tomorrow. We'll be doing, you're going to be designing and what are you going to be working on tomorrow? Okay, I'm going to be, this is stressful. Now you've just given me, <laughs> exactly, no, I'm just kidding. Okay, I'm going to be working on packaging. So I'm going to be doing more of the can. Amy's just done a rough mock-up, but I'll be working more on some can design. Uh, maybe the box carrier, the carton, maybe a coaster, maybe a, a like the delivery truck wrap. So stuff like that, that makes it feel even more real. And those are probably things that we wouldn't work on um, until after the client approved a logo. Because if you're working on all that kind of stuff before they've approved maybe the most core piece of the identity, which would be you know the logo, the type and the color, that would be a lot of different permutations to try for each concept. So we're probably just gonna pick a direction we like the best and then do those things tomorrow, which will be excited, exciting. Okay, so now I'm gonna go down up here and what I'm gonna do is I'm going to open my discovery that we created and I'm just gonna copy the page where we have this competitive landscape and I'm going to pop ours right in. So I'm gonna copy that, I've got command C, I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna go command um, option V, no command, <laughs> there we go. Yeah, command option shift V. And it, it was a bit of a different size. So I'm just gonna scale that down a bit, get it all in there. And this kind of le leads to a good point, which is a lot of the research and strategy we do for the clients at the beginning in the discovery deck, we're gonna bring that back into the proof deck because we wanna remind them of the terms for the win before we show them any design. Cause totally. it's weird. So for us, after we send the discovery, we'll tell the client, hey, give us two weeks and we're going to show you the, the first initial logo proof and why we need two weeks is because we're going to that's the most critical part of this process it's when we're trying so many different options we're throwing a lot of stuff out the window and we're trying to narrow it down to two great concepts that we're going to show them in a proof but in that two weeks they've seen a million other things that have probably made them forget about what we agreed on what our goals were <laughs> and they probably have all these different things swimming around in their heads kind of distracting them from what we all are trying to do so we want to remind them of the strategy and of the goals before we show them any of the proof work again yeah for yeah. sure okay so i've got that there kind of want to make that smaller so um and what i'm going to do is i think i'm going to take out i guess i'll do modern times and that will be where i place ours mm -hmm. So I'm gonna to go to my proof folder. I've got a mockups folder where I'm gonna keep everything and I'm just going to import our can. I'm gonna say, oh, let's see, use transparency information, yes. And I'm gonna place that in. It's really big compared to the others. So I'm just gonna scale that down and make it kind of match in size. So it doesn't feel dwarfed. You, want it to, you don't want it to feel dwarfed. You don't want it to feel too out of place. Like you're trying too hard to maybe like, look. Yeah. Look, it wins. <laughs> but you also want to make sure like it wins, you know? So I think it looks great. Yeah. I think it looks really good. It's, it's definitely very stark. cool as well. Like it feels like a hip brand, you yeah. know, but it also, we could easily change the background color for different um, different kinds of beers that we release. Like we yeah. have a white ale, we have a Pilsner, we have an IPA, right? So it leaves itself open for those kind of things, um, which I love, but you can see like already it's setting itself apart in a lot of ways with just like the vertical placement of yeah. the logo. Well, and you can see to this page, very simple page. Like we could get really like uh, OCD about the fact that this can isn't the same, you know, optical, <laughs> uh, you know, perspective. perspective as the others. But to be honest, every single page doesn't have to be picture perfect designed, especially if it's a strategy page. I feel like we can often derail ourselves with like going a little bit too um, crazy on proof decks. Yeah. But to be honest, the best templates for decks are simple and they're just type black and white simple because you don't want the layout of your decks to distract from the design, which is the, the key thing that you're trying to present or the information, right? Absolutely. Um, and I might over here, like if, you know, if we had a little bit more time, but I would probably, you know, 
at the beginning of my proof, I might even reinsert some of the pages that we used in the discovery. Exactly. Just again, for the reminder. And so that I have it to walk through them and kind of visually get their mind prepared. Yeah. So I might even do that. But these two decks, of course, are different sizes. Cause And Sarah, Sarah D was asking, how do you arrange your discovery uh, deck? Well, it can really go in any format you want, but we like to usually lead with the goal. And the goal is something that we have talked with the client about on the phone, but we have distilled it down into the very simple statement um, just because we want the client to know we heard them. And something as simple as this page, yeah. let, it puts their mind at ease because they're like, oh, thank goodness. They know what we want. They know what we're trying to do here. Yeah. Then we'll talk about their audience where we align on the, the visual goals. So, totally. yeah. All right. So I've got my goal, my audience, and I might even also put in, do you think we should put in the mood board? Sometimes I do with the client, but sometimes I don't because sometimes they get too attached to a mood board item. That's true. And I don't want them, I don't want them to think of that. We're going to just make a version of that for them. That's true. You know. And to be honest, sometimes in our uh, discovery sessions, I'll show the mood board. And then on the second page, I'll say, important note, we are not going to copy these things. We're <laughs> right. going to learn things from this mood board Why about what we all like, but we're going to have to apply it uniquely to our own brand. And you would think, duh, but don't have it in their mind that you're just going to rip someone off. And people don't understand that that's ripping people off. They right. think, oh, I just like that. It's design. We can do whatever we want, right? You have to educate them. So absolutely. I'm trying to figure out. Elevation Allah said, right before you mentioned going overboard on proof decks, I was about to suggest putting together a presentation in After Effects, LOL. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? For really big projects where it's like, you know, maybe it's that dream client where you really have to win people over and you get one big chance with like a board of directors or something. Dude, go overboard. Right. But I would say on your note, your day-to-day -day clients, like why make it harder than it has right. to be? That's funny. Yeah. Okay. So we've got this looking kind of good, you know? So now when we walk them through it, right? We can re-remind them of these exactly. things. Exactly. So it's looking pretty good. Yeah. And, um, and good about if that. we do include color in our proof deck or in any discovery deck for a client, we'll usually take the cues from the customer's existing brand. If they hate their brand, we won't use any color and we'll just um, black and white or black and tan. We're very averse to white. We use tan a lot instead of white. I like to use this off-white. Yeah. It's like, I don't know why, but it's just so visually pleasing. Yeah. But yeah, I'm going to go back to Illustrator and just adjust some of these artboards while we have these few last minutes left. And I can't wait till after we're off. I'm definitely going to be tuning into the rest of the days. Um, I want to see what Voodoo Val's up to because she's so fun. Oh, I know. Yeah. I still haven't figured out what I'm going to have to work on on my own time is figuring out this mark because I love oh, it, I love but I one. cannot figure out the And that pairing. might be the final one we use for tomorrow. We got to figure it out. Yeah. So that's what we're going to have to figure out in our own time. And you all, let's, I'm going to just label these and everyone vote in the chat, but we've got Page one. Oh, that's not a good one to use. Let's go. I'll just use Helvetica. But this is page one. Everyone vote on your favorite concept and let's see if we can make whichever one is chat's favorite work. So we've got, got option one, option two, and option three. And Which I know like, some of them are icons and some of them are word marks, but just whichever one your gut instinct likes best yes. so far, their works in progress. Help us because we won't be able to pick it's gonna be tough. on our own. Adriana, I'm so glad that you enjoyed this live stream. Come back tomorrow. By the way, you all, we're gonna be back tomorrow doing more of this brand. We're gonna be doing packaging, um, maybe some vinyl wraps for cars, um, stuff like that. So definitely tune in. Okay, we've got votes for two. There's a lot of twos. Oh, good. I love two. <laughs> some people like one. I know one's really good. We're obviously gonna, yeah, but we're gonna use for our final. Okay. I'm nervous. Oh, this is hard. We gotta, nope, some random threes <laughs> coming in. Okay. Uh oh. This kind of works though. This is Terry weird. Johnson says one, but no sun. Okay. So we're getting some without the sun. Okay. I think this could work. And then like we had on the other one, we could tuck the beer in between uh, green and room. Oh, oh, that'd be interesting. Yeah. yeah. So that could be cool. I kind of like that. I idea. always like when I see logos that someone just did something slightly off, like yeah. you would read it green room beer, but be and we can put beer in the middle because we're going to do it smaller. And so the hierarchy of size still lets people read it properly. Um, but like when I see people put icons to the right of the word instead of to the left or like to the right and up a little, like weird stuff like that, I think is it's interesting. Oh, we got a lot of threes now. Oh, this is getting hard. We just got a slew of threes. Uh -oh. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. <laughs> We're gonna have to go back through and try and count these. And I'm going to just Yeah, three is nice. Wow. Threes are winning so far. Really? Yeah. Wow, that came out of nowhere. I'm we might have to, ignore, we, I know we asked for your opinion, but, but now so, we might disregard it. <laughs> you just have to go with your gut. I'm just kidding. Oh. Just kidding. You're valued. You're valued and your opinion matters. 
this is blowing my mind though. This is interesting. These E's have this little tick on the end to where it's like, that's the only thing that's angled. I don't know about that. I'm going to go ahead and make that, that. Which I don't know if you knew this, you can use the align tools to align points. And Amy, gonna... ta Amy taught me that as well. Amy, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Joshua Young three. says, can you make the logo go bigger? <laughs> So funny. Okay, and I'm just that's like, vector. We can make it as big as we want. This is the glory of vector. Maybe this is where we get our Pirelli looking kind of like really wide. Oh, really wide. Because I was like oh, by maybe... over accentuating that. Yeah, because yeah, this could be a fun spot for that. Totally. So kind of like doing that. Oh, and it'd be cool if um it'd be cool if this beer could feel like the same weight as that, but I don't know if that's a possibility. Oh, right. You know, we could at least make it a little heavier. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead. Question Do you think the R is a bit too curly for the for, at the left icon which is a little bit minimal in a way yeah it is tough because i i like a juxtap juxtaposition i like that but um yeah it may not be the right thing but i the last thing i want to do on this live stream is scroll through fonts for i know that probably minutes. is the most <laughs> uninteresting thing that we could possibly do oh my gosh and i'll i'll do that on my own time and then my eyes will bleed um but yeah, i'll do is like what if we just highlight the r and just offset that lower so that there's less like room to do and that then, sometimes. Yeah, and yeah. then maybe beer. Put it up a little bit more though. Yeah, yeah. A little bit higher. Maybe even 12.5. Sometimes you gotta go in there and get some decimal points. But that oh, is a 12. great way to remove that. Sometimes there becomes like weird negative space between uh letters that or words that are stacked like that. Yeah. Um and then oh wow, look, then beer. The oh, chat you know is what? agreeing with me that that R might be too curly. Really? Okay. Well, we're <laughs> we're working on it. I know. We're working on it. To be honest, though, the first day you're usually in a fog. You can't really make too many decisions. You're just kind of. So we'll have to come back to this with uh, fresh eyes. Chris Porter said, "Busted out so many great concept, crazy fun designs." Oh, good. Thanks, Thanks Chris. Chris. Chris, have you watched Ted Lasso yet? If you haven't, I kept meaning to text you and be like, "Chris, you need to watch Ted Lasso because it blends style with football American style and it's so funny uh, and the south and the midwest and it's so good yeah and I think you would love it so we're gonna do like a co with like a cool little the o is up a bit yeah we'll just keep clicking on this a bit that might be too much it probably is but I'd like to I like to I like to push them to like the most extremes. Right. It is funny. We'll usually go way too far in a concept. And then by Rain day two in. or three, that's when we start reining it in and seeing how much we can take away. And yeah. of course, right now we're like, least. Yeah. don't look at it, come back to it, maybe send it out to a couple of friends for totally. feedback, but you really have to let it get. Right. But um, the, we, today we've been doing brand zeroing in on which we like best finishing it up so that tomorrow we can be working on packaging um some more uh like the can design the, the carrying case stuff like that so definitely tune in tomorrow but also there's tons of great programming still coming up today um so keep tuning in voodoo val is going to be back uh we've got kyle t webster is going to be coming up so keep hanging on keep on keeping on keep on keeping on i'm just gonna maybe just that spacing a bit. And thanks to everyone hanging out in the chat. <gasps> thanks. So I'm much telling for you, this is my this is my social <sighs> like this is my social interaction. Now. This has been so much fun. This in yeah. the grocery store. I just make <laughs> real meaningful eye contact with people at the grocery store with my mask on, um, and just be like, "Do you see me? I see you." <laughs> I know it's so funny. Somebody actually asked me out in the grocery store parking lot the other day, and they I was asked like, you out. They're like, "There's just something about you." I'm like, in my mask where you can't like. I don't know. What so did he weird. gather about you from the frozen aisle? I don't that know. Was like, I was like, how are we gonna? No, I think. I was like, I think, I think no, because it's a pandemic. And <laughs> but thank you so much. It was really nice. Anyways, well, thanks so much for hanging out with us, you all. Um, it's been an absolute blast. Please come back tomorrow so we can keep hanging out and and talking about TV, which is apparently all meaning we care about <laughs> pop culture. Yeah. We'll see you tomorrow.